at the context, and we did that very extensively. Looked at the international context, we looked at the African continent, the national, the provincial issues, as well as the local issues, South African higher education and the transformation agenda that is still far from ending. And we also looked at roads in particular and our uh, programs, especially the general formative uh, decree and whether that is still relevant as we uh, pave our way into the next, uh, or into the future rather. We looked at the performance trends in the general formative degree over the, the years. I think Dr. Nadozi has already painted a good picture because even in those workshops he presented us with all the things that he dealt with today. So I won't spend much time on those as we proceed. And we analyzed the current IDP, but with particular focus uh, on goals one, two, and five. Because those dealt with or deal with teaching and learning and student support, and five is about staff. And our interest there was about uh, uh, Chetil in particular and supporting uh, lecturers. I must say that um, in the first uh, workshop, we did most of um, the groundwork in terms of looking at the context and the challenges, as well as looking at uh, the strengths, the weaknesses, opportunities, and uh, threats. And in the second one, we're supposed to really bring everything else together and put together a, a plan. But I think we, we engaged too much and perhaps too far. We, you know, we got carried away with uh, talking about the challenges that we're facing. So eventually, the t its particular team had to go and put together goals, new goals or refined goals, as well as new objectives or refined objectives. So I will you know, understand if some members of the, those working groups or, or the members of the team would say, but I don't remember that but it is because eventually there was a team that had to finalize this work and come up with a report for this Lekhota. Uh, then going to the next slide, we looked at the key documents as we were advised, the National Development Plan and the Africa that we want, the, AE, the Agenda 2063, and the Global Sustainable Development Goals. And in particular, you see those issues that we have highlighted, uh, issues which we feel we should be able to address with our uh, general formative degrees or with our programs in general. So we try to say to ourselves, are our programs uh, relevant or responsive, rather, to the challenges as highlighted in these documents? Can we uh, address all of them or perhaps some? but I think it was important for us to actually lift all those issues so that we could see whether we have relevant programs to start with or whether our programs are adequate enough to address these issues. Do they need to be augmented in one way or the other? Do we need to develop different programs so that they, we can address these issues or not? I think you have gone through those quickly. You know, look at the that bullet to under the National Development Plan, capable state, building the capacity to govern with the people, for the people, ethics and ability. I think these are some of the biggest challenges that we have today, where we, have, we see uh, lots of corruption in government, or we see our municipalities not being able to deliver their services. So I think we really need to think about these issues carefully and see how we can make a difference through our own programs, through teaching and learning and other means. I'll move on. Our sort analysis, we were also instructed to just bring one. One um, strength, one weakness, one opportunity, one threat. It was difficult to do that. And I pulled a few of those from a huge uh, sort analysis that we did. You know, but just to highlight some of the things, you know, Rhodes University is 
a university that is blessed with, uh, well, it's a blessing perhaps, but not necessarily a blessing, full blessing, in terms of us having, having small classes or not being too big. But that is a blessing in that we can manage to assist all our students and get them through to the end. Our dual or formative degree and the flexibility in the curriculum is also a bonus. But is it really helping us or can we strengthen that? And then witnesses, even though we are said to be doing much better than other institutions, for us, we still feel we do not want to see our throughput rate go down. We want to not even maintain it. We want to make sure that it, it improves. Um, lack of accessible data to track students and lack of <laughs> interventions linked to this. I think those are some of the things that we've also realized. And as we move on to uh, development or refining of our objectives and goals, we try to align with some of these challenges that we uh, identified. Our move, I believe, student diversity was said to be a threat because we thought now we have only a particular uh, type of student and we do not see diversity. We still value a diverse uh, group of students because there's so much for students to benefit from uh, diversity. So, but at the same time, I think uh, Dr. Nadozi, you mentioned that that is a reflection of our uh, national demographics. But even so, we can manage to bring on board you know, a diverse cohort of students for the benefits that they will accrue from that. Uh, the municipality, I've gone the wrong way, Dr. Nadozi. I wanna go back, let's see. No. The down one. Let me see. There's something that I missed that I wanted to to mention there. Uh, there's a lot that you're going to see. Uh, the poor municipal services and the deteriorating state of Makanda. I thought this is important to mention. It is it is our problem. We cannot say it is the problem of the municipality. I think we have already noticed that it has become our problem in one way or the other. This is where our university is located. And if we do not do anything about it, then it is going to impact on uh, our sustainability in one or the other. And the key findings from the deliberations that we had, we group this into uh, the, the analysis of the ITP itself, where we looked in particular at goals one and two, and then also goal five the ones that relate to teaching and learning as well as student access and support to see how we had performed, but uh, Dr. Nadozi has given very clear uh, presentations. Those are the presentations that he made for us in the working group. And we are aware that uh, we are a research intensive institution, but one thing that we also noticed in our current IDP was that we do not have that uh, clear standalone uh, goal that really talks to teaching directly. So we, we, we are going to propose that as well. We'll see how we do that. I know that you know, it is implied somehow. Um, and and the, the performance, I'm not going to go into that because Dr. Nadozi has already showed us that. Um, goal five also that we focused, that I focused on as we put to the, this uh, together. For the, the reason that um, there wasn't much that was directly said in terms of academic stuff. And my intention was to have that very clear. Yes, they are stuff, but we need to pay particular attention to academic stuff as well. And you'll see as we uh, propose uh, goals as well as objectives what we present. The general formative degree, as I said, we looked at the four that we have for humanities, commerce, and science. Humanities, commerce, and science, and we also looked at whether, we, we, we were asking ourselves whether these are responsive and relevant to the new context. And I think, Dave, the, the, the vision 
it also ties very well with this because we're talking about responsiveness. You know, I think with us, we're looking at our programs. Are they responsive to what? Then we can link that with our vision as we move on. And what about the needs and the demands of the students and the country at large? And are this adequately preparing our undergraduate students not only for, we're not saying for employability, yes, it is important for us to start talking about that, you said so, Metali, although that is not the intention or the purpose of the university. I believe we cannot just sit back and say, it's not our purpose, therefore we, we are not involved. The rising unemployability also of our, or our graduate students says to us, we have to rethink the way things are going on. So again, are we preparing them adequately for postgraduate studies? Because we are a research intensive institution, we want a pipeline of uh, students that will take up postgraduate studies. Are our formative degrees preparing them adequately? What is it that we can do to make sure that by the time they finish this, they are ready to go into an honors and so on? Perhaps it could be through capstone courses, or it could be through short courses that are accredited this time, and maybe it could be through a focus on research at undergraduate level. And we also felt that the value proposition of our formative degrees should be clearly articulated and should be shared, not only with our students that we have, but also with the learners in schools as we recruit. You know, do, does everybody understand what a formative, uh, a general formative degree will do for them? The value of that. I think there's much more that we can do in terms of articulating the value proposition of our programs. And so that everybody sees that value and uh, comes to roles. Then we also looked at recruitment and student access to roles. Uh, and I think Meta and you have already mentioned that a lot of our uh, students now are under NSFAS and I, I'm happy that you have mentioned that NSFAS students seem to be uh, performing relatively well. I think that was a, a good point for us at this forum because we were wondering or we have been wondering whether uh, having NSFAS students does affect the quality or the success of students. But I think that is so important. They are academically deserving and they have done well, and some of them do use this opportunity and use it well. I think you affirmed some of the things that we needed to hear. The demographics, I won't mention, uh, touch on that. I think Dr. Nadozi have mentioned that. We need to have vigorous marketing of the general formative degree at various types of schools to address that issue of diversity. I think this is one of the reasons why we may not have achieved our uh, goal there because our focus was on uh, not all, was on public schools and bridging there to let them into roads, but we were not really uh, doing much, I, I guess, in terms of uh, going to other schools, the Quintile Five and many others just so that we have that balance. Um, and, and I think what is critical is for students who are with us to be apprised about the value of a formative degree. They should know what it means and what it can do for them. Uh, and we should make it clear that it does create opportunities as they finish their studies. Um, the role of the academic leadership in recruitment was also highlighted as very important that we, you know, as the, the academic leadership should work hand in hand with advance and comes in advancement to recruit the diverse, deserving, the diverse body of students that are deserving from all types of schools from everywhere. But that means we would need more resources to take people elsewhere, you know, even if it is not in the country itself. There is also a need to establish sustainable long-term partnerships or relationships with potential feeder schools. And we also debated who should do that. And we're thinking it needs to be done by the leadership 
whether it's academic leadership or the executive leadership, but it has to be at that level. And we need to strengthen our, um, our ties also with the alumni, who must also act as our brand ambassadors. As we try to think, many of our, our alumni you know, are holding big positions in the country. You know, um, if I have to just even look around, I come from Rhodes and here I am standing here as the DVC academic. You know, though I haven't done the formative degree, but if when I thought about this, I could see uh, there is our CFO. He has been to Rhodes, and then many other people. If people could, can, uh, can you put up your hand if you have studied at Rhodes, please? Let me just see how many people in this room. <laughs> Everybody, you know. So are we selling? Are we selling this formative degree the way we should? Are we? Here we are. We are ambassadors ourselves. And so I think there's. It, we have work to do. It's not hard work to do. It's easy work to do because we can speak about what we've, we got here at Rhodes University. The locality, we also felt every time we talk about where Rhodes is located, it's like we're just talking about it's in a rural, in the most uh, impoverished uh, uh, what province. We really never use that uh, in a way that can uh, position us as a, a, a what a university that people want to come to yes it is a research intensive university that does well in, in research but why is it that when we talk about ourselves we then want it's like we want to be pitied by people here we are in this small place there are no resources the municipality is not doing this and that for us so i think there are small things that we can uh, work on in terms of where we want to go Throughput, I think Dr. Nadoz, you did that. But we noticed also that less than 50% of our own students to complete their degree in minimum time, in three years. Most of them will complete in N plus one or even N plus two. That is something that we also saw. What does this mean for us? Should we continue the way we are continuing? Does it imply that we perhaps needed that uh, uh, four-year, you know, qualification that was proposed at some point, or does it mean that we need to have some uh, bridging, some ground uh, bridging and support for our students? But this is what we got from uh, data that we analyzed. And dropout rate is high during the first two years of study. You know, 23% of our students drop out. I think that also tells us something that we need to do in terms of support and success. <laughs> And completion rate differs in the different uh, BA degrees. If you look at that, you'll see that highest in uh, uh, Bachelor of Sociology, and it, the highest that we've ever had in, in five years was 63.55%. So all these things tell us something that we need to be mindful of. Generally, the throughput rate has been decreasing over the, five, the, the past 10 years, and there is evidence that throughput of students in various foundation programs also differs. Yes, we have support, but some foundation programs do better than the others. And what it means is that we can look at your foundation program, Dave, you know, and borrow from whatever you are doing to augment our own. I think uh, um, science also will have other nice things that they do in terms of augmentation. So I think. This was telling us a lot of uh, information that we needed. We felt that there needs to be a coherent, well-coordinated students' academic development and support, uh, way in support, maybe a framework for student experience, academic development support for, as well as a, a reimagined orientation week. We need to reimagine these things. A lot of things are there. We noticed we have different things uh, pockets of good practice in different departments, but what we need to do is to coordinate so that you know, we can uh, scale them to other faculties as well. More courses perhaps need to be augmented, especially with the focus on gateway, call them gateway or call them killer courses, those courses in which students have not done well in the five 
for the past five years. And the last one, I think, Matt and you mentioned that institutional research and tracer studies we should do to track where our students end. Firstly, to start tracking those at risk and then to track those who graduate. Are they employed somewhere? Are they furthering their studies? Are they unemployed? Are they self-employed? Or are they engaged in other activities? This is something that we also need that will tell us about the value of our formative degree and others. Um, then the last theme was technology, uh, which we thought needed to be infused in all our programs. And I think it's really the use of uh, blended learning and the use of are you connected? We have already seen what happened uh, in the last two years and we really need to resource uh, EdTech better to help us to uh, do so. Um, and there was also uh, that appetite for online courses maybe, and uh, especially in postgraduate studies, so that we can get that wider reach of students, or we can cater for students who may not be able to come and study here physically, especially the adult group. So there were many things that we talked about. Finally, I get to the real, real work that we had to do. Uh, reviewing our existing goals and suggesting refinement. The first goal, um, which remember I said we looked at goal one, two, and five, which were specific to teaching and learning and student access and support. Uh, that is what it is currently, maintain and strengthen our general formative degree offering uh, and research, teaching and learning, and we refined it in the next. And I know that, well, these are semantics where the word maintain is used, somebody might feel it doesn't really say you keep something the same, but somebody else may understand as we are happy with where we are and we not hoping to improve. There are the reasons on the side in terms of why we are suggesting this. We also felt that there wasn't that clear goal that really talked about teaching and learning so that we could also think of objectives that could enhance teaching and learning. So we want to ensure quality scholarly teaching and learning to enable students to access powerful knowledge, engage in their learning and become critical problem solvers who are socially responsible. And I think without, without knowing what the vision was, so there some of the things are coming into this uh, aspiration for teaching and learning. This is open to uh, change. We'll hear what people suggest we uh, put, uh, how people suggest we put it. But this is what we thought, that, that um, powerful knowledge uh, for some time, we kept talking about what exactly is powerful knowledge. Will everybody understand what powerful knowledge means? I think the last bit that we're putting in is to try and explain what powerful knowledge can do without anybody having to ask uh, what is powerful knowledge. Then if they do the others, then you know, they will respond. Um, there are some key questions there in terms of is our formative degree adequately addressing the challenges that we spoke about? Um, is it providing our graduates with opportunities for employability? I put that in quotes, you know, employability or whatever else that they may want to do when they finish their studies. And, uh, or maybe giving them that competitive edge, just being, comp is it responsive to the country and the continent's developmental needs? that global you know, look as well. The second one, uh, we also, I think we touched it slightly uh, by altering, well, it said we enable the, the students to flourish and promote the, the holistic. And we thought perhaps flourish is a nice term. What is it that we want out of them? We want them to, to succeed. So we replace that with succeed. But again, we will hear what people have to say. Do you want to have that nice word there, or do you want to have an exact thing that we want in terms of this particular goal? I think those nice words, they belong to your vision. That's where we can put, put them. But when we talk about the goals, we need to be exact 
so that people know exactly what we expect them to do. Um, they are the reason that side, and we set new objectives for this particular goal uh, that speak directly to student academic uh, development and support as well as success. Um, but with the mind that we have many of those that need to be coordinated and that need to be monitored so that we know their effectiveness and whether we are achieving. There is also need to focus on career guidance and improved marketing of our formative degree and other programs. I think those are the things that we are trying to be mindful of as we set that particular one. Um, then the uh, goal number five, Currently, I know Peter, you might have looked at uh, goal number five or maybe HR, but I felt, you know, because I need to be thinking about academics, I want to have to see whether it addresses those things that are important. Attract nature and retain staff of high caliber and maintain an inclusive, welcoming, affirming and positive institutional environment. That's the current one. And we said, we didn't change it much, it's altering a little. Attract nature and retain staff of high caliber and ensure an inclusive, positive, and enabling institutional environment. And we thought that word enabling will allow us to put several things that will uh, address, you know, a, a what? Positive, perhaps, or in a very, uh, or an inclusive, you know, all those things can come, you know, under that enabling. And we already have, I must say, uh, uh, put some KPIs for all of these things. It's just that I had to align myself with what the task I was given. But there are KPIs that we have already put in place. But you'll see as we move closer to the objectives. Because for this particular one, we have to also design objectives. Uh, the last one, the, the digital transformation. I'm not going to talk about that. I think Professor uh, Wells is the one that has been given that mandate. But we thought perhaps we need a new goal that focuses on that. I don't know whether you decided to have it as an objective under something. But if we really want to embrace digital transformation, because it is in various areas, including teaching and learning, and all other finance and many others, perhaps it needs to be a standard goal. Uh, so and you can see where the student learning comes in, support, and many other things. So these are the, the objectives. The new existing objectives from goal one, and goal two, and goal five. You know, uh, colleagues, when I say we, remember you gave me a mandate. You discussed all the challenges, and you said, go finish this thing. So we did that in Professor the first one, which was done well, according to Dr. Nadozi, ensuring accreditation uh, and recognition of all academic programs. We also all had that in it. You know, our feeling was that we are really not concerned about just accreditation. What we are concerned about is quality. So let's bring in that word, you know, ensuring quality. Then accreditation will come as a result of us having a quality program that we have developed. Um, and then, um, then there were two new uh, KPIs that we set for that. Uh, some of them come from the CAG self evaluation uh, that we have just done. Some of the gaps that we identified there now have come onto this to become our KPIs. Um, then the next one for on research led approaches, there was a slide review as well. Um, review and ensure the relevance and responsiveness of our curriculum or programs by drawing on research led approaches to curriculum design, teaching, and assessment. So, here we just be saying exactly what we want to do. It's about relevance. And here we say we want to avoid mindless cycles of repeated reviews that we just do because we have to do a review. What are the reasons why we have to, to review our curriculum? So every time we see that we are no longer responding, or perhaps uh, there are new trends, then we will initiate. You want, to, you want me to finish? Okay. 
But I told you what you should do, Dr. Nakuru. While you think I'm talking too much, just move the slide. <laughs> <That's amazing. laughs> so this are, let me just show you the other ones. Uh, the key assisting objectives, strengthen and enhance. Then the objectives that are needed to achieve them. Uh, they strengthen and ensure the relevance and responsiveness. It could be almost the same as the other, but we'll see. And then promoting wide, wider reach. This one talks to uh, the educational technologies. You'll see that it does also. They will be thinking, you know, strength and use educational technology and digital transformation to provide wider reach. So we bring in some of these things that are new that we need to focus on. Can I move on to the next one? Um, uh, can you move that for me? Because now I'm going yeah. This one, I must confess to the working group. This was never in our discussion at all. But transformation, transformation we did discuss. And issues of language are things that we need to be mindful of. The reason why I came here was that I had to attend uh, at a seminar on, well, with a seminar colloquial voice, uh, Professor uh, uh, Dion. And I noticed that if we do not say anything about this anyway, not gonna go. So there it is. It's a proposal. So I'm not posting it on anybody. It's a proposal. Should we also pick it up? Develop an enabling mantra for environment in which African languages can develop as languages of scholarship, research, as well as teaching and learning, and support students' access and support. This has an implication for our students' success as well. So it is a proposal. There's much more to do. But that KPI is just one. There are many things that can be done today. But all I wanted was for people to see that there are many things that we need to elevate to a particular level so that we don't forget. Um, this is goal two. The direct promote diversified student body. It was just like a shot. And then we ensure an integrated approach to student recruitment and create an institutional culture that enables that the students to succeed. So we, we really you know, move it in another direction. That is what you suggest. I'll go to the next one. Uh, new objectives altogether. Create an enabling environment that is conducive to quality teaching, student engagement, and learning, learning and success. And those will be the KPIs that we would bring on board. But I think people can read this document and also suggest uh, you're going too far. Let's cut it here or whatever. But those are KPIs because this is a totally new objective. And then another new objective, ensuring a holistic student experience and success through the quality, coherent, well-integrated student academic development and student experience program. I think we need to focus. We did not have anything that focused directly on support for students at that level. Then we can stretch out KPIs and strengthen career guidance and curriculum advising to ensure appropriate costs and set choices for improved student protection, throughput, and employability. That also we can check whether we want to bring in issues of employment. Those are the KPIs, place of time, and so on. Uh, goal five, creating an enabling environment <coughs> for academics to develop as good teachers. And develop academics as scholarly teachers to engage and reflect on their teaching and integrate their research with their teaching to improve student learning. The KPIs are on the other side. Developmental plans for academics who are on probation, perhaps a portal for Staff development resources for academic development and academic staff being allocated time to successfully complete the catalyst course. That that is creation of an enabling environment, you know, with those. And then perhaps for the second one, short course of how to develop a scholarly teacher. Uh, Mandy, we still have to to work on that. But there is a short course that they would like to develop. That is the case. And it is something that can happen. Um, 
Uh, then, uh, this is the last one. So, last class. Develop and implement a talent management strategy. I think that would belong to Sue Robertson, but I feel even for our academics, we need to have a way to put tie with the first one, where we're talking about developmental plans and so on and so forth. Ensure that Chattel is well resourced to strengthen existing programs and to ensure you know, that his quality and development support. I think resourcing is critical. KPI would be that revised study or revised resourcing model for Chattel. And then lastly, strengthen the induction program for academic staff and ensure ongoing support for any career. That's not the last one now. Maybe <laughs> and if you look at the KPIs, it's not that there's anything wrong with them, with the induction program, but we notice that some academics who are not in the end career, who are not in the end game, they feel they have a good thing at the beginning, and then nobody <laughs> cares as they move along. So if we have some ongoing uh, management support for early career academics that could assist. And the last one, management program for new HOEs and deans as well as early career academics. But these are not, they are not compulsory, they are available, we enable and people can uh, do them so that they enrich themselves. Thank you, Sam. Well, welcome. Thanks very much. Um, you have certainly initiated our reimagining of what it is that we need to do to action the mission and the vision. And um, I think also what's important to take into account, particularly the chairs of the breakaway groups, is to look for alignment between what needs to be done to the mission and the vision, and also to look for alignment between different focus areas. So in other words, you were also mentioning what you soon need to um, focus on as well. So I think that, that comparison and contrast needs to be taken into account as well. You also highlighted an important point, and that is what you were mandated. So from that perspective, we all have had an opportunity to give input into your mandate. So from that perspective, if we have any points that we feel need to be debated for this particular topic, please let uh, Mandy have them at a later stage. Given the time considerations, we now get to move on to the next topic, and here I'm going to hand back to Noel. So, Mabokan, thanks very much. Right, so the, the next topic then is to do with the, the working group that looked at the program and qualification mix, Professor Sandile Kamanga, over to you. Thank everybody that came to that working group. Thank you so much for your contribution. Colleagues, the, the last communique from Commonwealth Advancement said we need to imagine to come up with a, to articulate a bold and ambitious uh, vision uh, that is going to advance our impeccable scholarly uh, journey that we take as a university. And the, the first word that we captured was the bold. And the vision has already been articulated in terms of sustainability. And uh, good afternoon, uh, colleagues. We are the program and qualification mix group. Uh, what we look at in the PQM is just a, a brief on the list of qualifications that, or programs that the university offers. And there is no doubt uh, that when it comes to the PQM, uh, it's at the heart 
of every higher education institution. And you strategically place a, a good PQM. Uh, most of the challenges uh, that we, we see in other spaces, uh, somehow, that's the first step. We had several activities uh, in coming up with uh, the, the, the whole uh, presentations. Obviously, from a PQM point of view, we were, we were strategic from, from our first step. We approached deans, we approached deputy deans, we approached HODs, uh, in the belief that the NCAP programs at the university, and that was strategically our target group. Target group in one sense, that they would be able, therefore, to articulate all of this with uh, their divisions or departments, etc. We then came up with a, a structured questionnaire uh, that, was, that was able to, to ventilate and also to try to understand what's happening in faculties and departments. It was important as well in the, the letter uh, that we received from the Vice Chancellor. It said we should address specific uh, issues, and we are going to uh, present them as well. So, in presenting a PQM, I, I think it first needs to to understand the list of the programs that we have in uh, at Rhodes University, and uh, Remy has a very very nice uh, uh, slide that actually shows what we have at Rhodes University in all the faculties. So we have to come up first with a, an instrument, viability instrument, uh, of the, the list of programs uh, that we have at Rhodes University and prepare holistically whether there is a demand for a particular qualification and uh, the DVC has already spoken to the point of quality of uh, our offering, and we are not going to be able to move forward if we don't understand our own eco academic ecosystem in terms of opportunities that are offered by uh, having such a mix. Strategic importance, the three documents that we highlighted and we are going to look at them as well to say how do we come up with a particular program. So if we have, we structure ourselves in terms of a, having a particular instrument that we use. And we also cast our net as well, understanding in our boldness going forward, are we capable of unleashing a program of a particular magnitude. So presenting the five here, and we deliberately left out cost in, in, in this, in this uh, PQM. And I'll explain why we left out cost. Because we were initial in the sense that we needed to be bold first, to understand the needs, the importance, and thereafter, uh, I hope that our pockets based on opportunities and strategic importance of the programs will be able to unleash us to the future. These were the questions that were posed. Uh, the letter from the Vice Chancellor said, in the PQM, let's look at three. Programs that we offer roads that we need to discontinue. Programs that we offer roads that we need to reconfigure. And programs that we offer roads, qualification that we need to introduce. And that is going to be based on there are opportunities, strategic importance. We are capable of uh, presenting these programs at Rhodes University. 
We received uh, responses from several departments, and I'm going to show they are on uh, the significance of that. The program that departments uh, presented to us with their reasons of sleep, if you go to our Google Drive, you are going to see uh, what was presented on that. And coursework Master's Environmental Biotechnology, English Language Teaching, Bachelor of Business Science, Diploma in Fine Arts, but that one has already been discontinued, I think it's 2017 or something. And one that would need to be reconfigured. The first one, it's a Master's in Environmental Biotechnology to Natural Resource Management. That one is a professional qualification. And there is also two PhDs that are registered. PhD in English and Linguistics and PhD in Linguistics and Applied Language Studies. So the suggestion there was to merge the two uh, because there is no difference between them. So that is what was presented uh, to us. And programs to introduce a professional doctorate in pharmacy that would be specifically for uh, industrial pharmacy, uh, clinical pharmacy, and also a master's program in good manufacturing practice, suggestions on the Bachelor of Language in Linguistics, to reintroduce from a diploma in fine art to a postgraduate diploma in fine art. And industrial and organizational psychology coursework. Uh, it means that at some point there was a postgraduate diploma in investment finance. So to bring that back. And all of these programs, courses, when you start looking at data science in collaboration with math and or information systems, uh, the, the, the idea there is we already have established departments. We have individuals who are capable and we, we need to reimagine, we need to be bold in what we are doing. So the data science will speak to data analytics, uh, artificial uh, intelligence, etc. The analytics of it is such. And in looking at that holistically, we speak of sustainance. Let's take advantage of our university. We've been offering programs for more than 100 years. International reputation for excellence in what we do. And I think it was very interesting to hear what Tani said about our education faculty the teaching and learning space, what we offer for the whole country. How have we submerged ourselves to be able to extract uh, that, that, that kind of a, a, the space that we command in teaching and learning. So that, that, that's why then we speak of, if we really want to be a sustainable a university, it's, it doesn't really require someone from outside to tell us that if we widen our scope in terms of programs that we offer, those that we are going to attract will be able to increase uh, our numbers. This is just the first conclusion, uh, just presenting on what we saw when we received the responses. We did not get 100% responses from departments. We first went to HR to be able to get the list of uh, the proper current list of HODs at Rhodes University. Uh, HR, they kindly sent us that. 
And I think it's important, we mustn't miss this opportunity to ask, why did he not respond? And I, I just, I'm just bringing this specifically to, our, to my colleagues, the deans and the deputy deans. Just, just to understand, uh, obviously in one of the conversations that we had when we, when we were deliberating about this, it was, everything was happening during the time of uh, assessments, exams, the short break, etc. There were 15 responses, quality responses, colleagues. Uh, let's not take the 15 as just a number. These were individuals who responded adequately from five faculties. And the feedback that we received as well, it, it said to us, let's really be innovative in how we will to move forward. And also try to understand, coming back to what Tanya said, uh, diminishing funds from, from government. If we come up with a proper structure, articulated MOAs, MOUs, with other sister brother universities that offer certain programs, how we strengthen uh, such programs. Uh, right, right now, I, I know in the faculty we are based, there is a short course that we shall be uh, uh, presenting with the uh, uh, NMU. Uh, the course has been accredited by uh, our bodies as well and it's supported by the Pharmacy Council. It's on immunization. So we have launched that one and we are moving forward. So it really speaks to that. And getting to the, the landscape as well, and I have indicated there that the analysis that we are going to present uh, with data that is, I would say it's missing at the moment because we, we didn't get uh, information from others as well. But during the time and after, I've been able to engage with other colleagues from other departments and they are very interesting uh, programs that we have already started discussing, uh, master's degrees in medicinal chemistry, uh, etc. thinking about uh, courses in instrumental analysis that we can anchor at those university uh, one would believe as well that we've got the best equipment, instruments, analytically in South Africa when we start thinking of institutes uh, that we have. And that gives us another opportunity and we just need to uh, reimagine, revitalize and put that in a proper structure uh, that, is, uh, that is there. Uh, the document that we received, the template from, from Remy, it said we must bring a one a strength, weakness, opportunity, and threat. We had lots. Uh, we can send you Remy's uh, strength and weaknesses and all of those. The graduation rate through flexible curricula in line with artistic, social, and the world of work. Uh, the DPC has already spoken about the flexible curricula which means that there is convergence in what we are talking about. We do look at our PQM in its current form, shape, size, and uh, that is currently a weakness for the university, and we need to cover a diverse range of qualifications. Uh, colleagues, I'll, I'll share just uh, on 10 seconds. I'm currently sitting with applications more than 100 from students who are at Rhodes University in other programs who want to study pharmacy. They are in first year, they are in second year, they are in third year, they are in honors, they are in masters, they are in PhD. They say they want to go back and study pharmacy. I don't have my grade at the moment but it does give us an opportunity to say, 
four years ago, five years ago, six years ago, there are other students who made a deliberate choice to come to Makana. We are losing those students because we are unable to take them through programs. And they, they do say that where they want to go to, they said that this is current, I can just send it. Uh, I, I think the first person I'll send it to the DDC academic, uh, just for her to, to really start uh, realizing what we are talking about in the weakness being our PQM. Would love to take all of them, uh, but it's, it's just not possible. And these are very, very good students, uh, by the way. Uh, even in their first entry at university, they had 45 points and above, and they have got qualifications. And we've seen them, some of them in our programs, in terms of the influence they bring to first time entering students, the attitude, their pedagogy philosophy in terms of, in terms of learning, their approach in what they do. Opportunities. The programs that we hope uh, if we move forward with what's presented, it will create new cross-disciplinary networks and we're going to see how that comes about. Threats are, are universal. Infrastructure, retention of staff, sufficient resources. Uh, I hope as well that as we package what we think makes sense to all of us, we'll see that at some point cost could be an issue at present. In the future, maybe it could be something that could be addressed. I really want to believe as well that some of the programs that we are enjoying today, the professors of yesterday, they also have the same sentiment to think that what they start Cost has always been a perennial issue from day one. So I'm just uh, bringing that so that we have a, an idea as we excite, we throw the spark in our discussion. Strategic goals that we found that are applicable to the group were goal number one and goal number seven. Uh, a little bit of uh, fine tuning in those ones there. The slides are available on the, on the Google Drive. Uh, we may just look at them later on. Just because of time, I just want to also bring that in terms of suggested revision, refinements, and sharpening on those ones. We just went to goal number one, one point four, uh, where we had a, a short presentation there. And that has also been touched on by the teaching and learning uh, focus group. The next step, what we think would make sense to us. I've deliberately spoken to the issue of cost to say concerns about funding and resources. Uh, we, we didn't bold it here, but I, I think that let's make it the last point. It must not be used to discourage innovation in advancing a university teaching them. And we'll be able to analyze the qualitative data coming from this discussion uh, in terms of what programs, why do we need to introduce specific programs. And like I said, some of the programs that you will see, this is now on the discussion. Uh, that the, the focus group now, having collected and scanned the South African higher education institutes of what they offer and also what we are capable as well of offering. The physics department, the electronics department roads, we read about them. We read about SKA, we read about all the gigantic work that they are doing. Perhaps using this platform, it makes sense that the conversation that speaks to the two, having a conversation around unleashing a powerful electronics engineering department for Rhodes University. 
when we talk of us being bold, we're talking about being ambitious. We talk about us having to advance our scholarly, uh, impactful legacy. How do we do that? So that is the first conversation. The second one, we went through curriculum for other universities, UCT, versus university in terms of actually assigned. And this is very important in the sense that all the courses, I mean all the departments that we really speak to actually are science, we have them in the university. You look at what other universities do in first year, we do this. What they do in second year, we do this. What they do in third year, economics, accounting, statistics, mathematics, all about risk analysis speaks to time series when it comes to statistics. And all of that are things that we have. So we've been sitting with the platinum, gold, diamond, which we really need to sharpen. We expand as well in terms of a, we have a very strong department of HKE, human kinetics and economics, we also have pharmacy. And moving forward, what does it take to move from HKE to kinetics? Register with the Health Professional Council of South Africa. What does it take for us, once we have placed that together, to go to sports sciences? What does it take for us, with the strong foundation that we have at Roots, uh, one would really be surprised that we've got a very, very strong anatomy and physiology uh, personnel at Rhodes University. Uh, anatomy and physiology personnel at Rhodes University. You find them in HKE, you find them in pharmacy. We've got a very strong pharmacology department at Rhodes University. All of that, it really speaks to us. Talking loudly about it, up to the point of what physiotherapy is. Laboratory diagnostics. Right now we have a visitor from, from Poland. Uh, he's just told us something very interesting, how the COVID uh, took them to, to their corners. They never had enough uh, laboratory microbiologists or medicinal sciences when it comes to that. Why do we want to believe? Well, that we have a very, very strong uh, department at Rhodes University, starting from microbiology, biochemistry, and now moving specifically to say, medical laboratory diagnostics. I know that some chairs as well, they work in the area of diagnostics. Personally, I don't want to believe that to test for COVID, it should be more than 500 rand. Personally, the same technique is used for a pregnancy test. And it just shows the challenges that we have. We speak of local and global tentacles when it comes to the things that we want to achieve as a university. Radiography, dentistry, these have been placed in the, comes from our faculty as well. To look at it in terms of uh, starting from Walter Sisulu, Fort Hare, Rhodes University, uh, Nelson Mandela University, none of the universities offer this program that we are talking about. What are we saying as a university? What's our voice to say, yes, the local schools or provincial schools, they've got good students, we support some of the schools, they must go somewhere else. So that's a conversation as well. I will receive some of the students as an exchange when it comes to that. Again, that presents opportunities which we may not be able to be, to be able to address. But as we unleash the path that we want for the university going forward, maybe 10 years later, 20 years later, those will come after us they'll be able to look back and say at least there was thinking that was taking place. These are just suggestions of, as we reconfigure, placing ourselves into spaces 
to start thinking about existing programs that are very good, including climatology, meteorology, nature conservation, photogrammetry, and we can have very, very strong schools uh, at Rhodes University. School of Life Sciences, we already have that discussion and we know that we have these programs at Rhodes University. How are we going to look at it in terms of the, the hierarchy of priorities that we are going to look here? May I just uh, pause and say some programs, some departments already exist. We just need to be able to sit down and say it needs no infrastructure. What it means, it needs personnel. We can prioritize that in terms of ranking or in terms of definitions to say this is very important or this is absolutely very, very important. We give it a nine. When we think that infrastructure cost is going to be an issue, we can put it in terms of one, two, and three. All of this, they respond to the NDP 2030, UN 2030 agenda, and we hope that they will align to our vision and mission. The demand of these programs, think about employability of our students, now I'm talking about the cost of the qualifications. And also, we can have our own simple uh, matrix, how we're going to judge what is really viable for the university. I thank you. Right, we have one minute for any questions for clarification. Are there any questions? Um, thank you, Prof, for your wonderful um, presentation. This is actually in relation to how do we continue to make our degree structure more relevant, and I think your presentation addresses that. So my question is, since you want to introduce actual science, um, I wanted to find out whether you have benchmarks on the university in terms of um, removing uh, the Bachelor of Business Science, because if you're going to introduce actual science, I don't have Bachelor of Business Science. It's a bit shaky. So I just wanted to know whether you've done some benchmarking to find out how our universities are sustaining that degree. Thank you. Thank you, thank you colleagues. The, the Bachelor of Business Science is a response from departments to say the demand wasn't uh, there for a number of years. Obviously, that conversation, when you think of uh, actual science, you are starting now to think of uh, investment risks today in planning, in modeling, going forward. You are asking about the other universities as well. Yes, I've looked at it personally after it has been thrown to us. You start looking at the, stage, the actual science society and their conversation around it it's very difficult to even get the individuals who will be able to, to understand all of that. I think when you start looking at it together with the investment analysis and the data science, we may become one of the universities to go to for young South African, African international students when it comes to them understanding data analytics. Right, thank you. We're going to break now for lunch. We run out of time. Um, we would like to start, if we can, at 5 past 3, please. That gives us 15 minutes to take lunch. So if you could please return to the venue at 5 past 3. Thank you. Right, so we're now going to hear from Norma, and in particular the focus of attention is going to be how can we enhance the student experience moving forward in order to action the vision and mission of Rhodes University. Welcome Professor Suri. <laughs> and he flows in. 
Loma, over to you. without the people that are concerned. That is the students. The SRC president is here with me. He will speak to one slide just to confirm what I've just said. Um, the mandate, uh, borrowing from uh, the words of my boss, Professor Manupula Mapesela, the mandate that we were given is to look at uh, enhancing student experience by focusing on student resident system that supports student holistic development, growth, and academic success. We are also tasked to look at the resident system as living and learning spaces. And I worked, we worked very closely with Ms. Jane Pillay, she's there, uh, to look into that area. We also looked at uh, growth and academic success, uh, services that we can develop to support students for academic success. Uh, we look to building a holistic support system, including supporting uh, sporting. And Miss Mains is here. She assisted us as the chair of sports council, together with uh, the manager of sports at me. We also looked at the recreational facilities, uh, of which um, the SRC really liked in this part. Psychosocial support was also the area that we looked at as well as health and wellness, which is kind of my area of expertise, leadership and career counseling. So those are the focus areas. And I'll just ask Ubu Kade to just take us through in terms of the processes that we followed to gather information regarding this. Greetings to the people here at the Lokota. I hope that everyone is doing well and I'm happy to see that you've all arrived safely. My name is Mutalim Bissel Zile. I'm a Master of Economics candidate and SRC president. Um, so as stated earlier, there has been a key focus particularly on the plans that have been put forth for the IPP. There have been some key focus groups particularly in the, uh, the student leadership aspect where the residents come to meet with the residence committee, so that would consist of your whole race and your whole senior students in the absence of the whole race, and then we had student parliament actually sit down and discuss the IDP in length, that they did focus on the sustainable development goals, Agenda 2063, um, and the other document which speaks to it, so it's Agenda 2063, the SDGs and the National Development Plan 2030. So we did have everything encapsulated in those key discussions. So as you can see on this slide here, we did have um, the focus groups, uh, as per the, as per what I said, um, you know, the student leaders at the SRC, and we also analyzed how we could um, enhance the student experience in that regard. And we did have key surveys that were done by the DSA where students could actually engage and say that this is what they were happy with and this is what they were not happy with. So that has been outlined quite clearly as to what we did, and we do hope that you do enjoy this um, presentation that will be done by the Director of Student Affairs. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mutale. Uh, in terms of a SWOT analysis, we looked at the strengths, as you can see, when it comes to student experience at Rhodes University. We realized that we have good policies and protocols. Uh, we have a small campus, um, and that, to a certain extent, as the BBC mentioned, it does work to our advantage because our students do get that individual attention which gives us a sense of a personal touch when we know each and every student. Students like that. Witnesses, we have limited social spaces, as you might be aware. 
that came through very strongly from all the surveys that um, who have taken away the social side of, 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 of the life of the student. And I'm glad that um, Dr. Tan at the beginning did mention the fact that we must not forget that students are also social beings. They are not only academic beings. Uh, students spoke a lot in terms of weaknesses of our own dilapidated facilities or residences that speaks to infrastructure and maintenance issues. Uh, they spoke about limited resources, that is our budgets. And I must say the SRC was very vocal about this one, um, Mr. Riga, that they are not happy about their budget to an extent that limits their student experience. In terms of opportunities, um, there are opportunities to enhance the experience for this degree. Uh, the key words when we speak about student experience are holistic development as well as developing an all-rounded uh, 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 graduate. Um, as an opportunity for us to deal with these weaknesses by introducing a student hub or a center to promote overall well-being. Uh, in terms of modernization and innovation, which is um, part of uh, the key principles that guide this whole process, the web talks around uh, establishing smart or green spaces. In terms of threats, the biggest threat that we're experiencing that we've noticed as student affairs is the fact that our students do not retain. And uh, Professor Bo did a, 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 some research in terms of why that is happening. But some of it has to do with the experience, and it means then, therefore, we need to ensure that we put a lot of resources into ensuring that we promote um, holistic wellness and, and, and a balanced life. And one of the threats is that we'll have graduates that will leave um, being just academically strong without having a balanced or, or, or a holistic life. Uh, that is the SWOT analysis. And then we looked in, uh, in terms of the various uh, sources of, uh, of, 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 of information. These are the themes that came through from all the various uh, gatherings and discussions, the surveys and all that. Uh, there were issues around academic experience. Remember, when we are speaking about student experience, it cuts across in terms of their academic experience, their experience in the classroom and outside of the classroom, in the residence system, on campus, off campus. So it speaks to all that. There were grievances around academic uh, experience, as you can see there, lot of lack of support. I won't read everything. Uh, there were concerns around uh, the theme of lack of support for opinions, that is students that live off campus came through very strongly. Issues of safety on campus, um, frustration with administrators uh, within the halls, and that one has been dealt with. Thank you to HR, that's an HR matter. Uh, there were issues around uh, the booking system of the healthcare center and the counseling center when it comes to the themes that came through. Uh, we asked them about the library. Uh, they spoke about more resources needed at the library. As you can see, the one that came through very strongly was the issue of um, instability when it comes to Wi-Fi uh, in the library as well as generally in the residence system. Maintenance issues uh, came out very strongly. Uh, also, postgraduate students, they felt unsupported. Um, they spoke about the whole issue of alcohol and the fact that because uh, there's, there's not enough social activity, there are not enough social activities on campus, this drives them to a sense of having to go off campus and drink and what have you. So we need to deal with that culture of being viewed as a, as a, as a university where our students drink by increasing uh, these social spaces or so social activities. Also, what also was positive about the residence system, they liked the fact that it gives them a sense of structure. And there was a lot that was said around issues around food, hygiene, uh, as well as uh, hygiene dining halls, as well as within the residence system. And um, we will kind of provide suggestions in terms of how to deal with this. Again, the issue of limited spaces on campus to facilitate social events. Uh, 
we did ask them about facilities generally on campus. Uh, they also spoke about computer labs and hygiene there. Uh, then there are suggestions down there in terms of what needs to be done. Uh, in terms of equity and institutional culture, our students are saying uh, they are worried that our campus is not really accessible when it comes to students that are living with disabilities or that are using these terms. We need to look into that. Um, and they, as you can say, they say while there is some promotion of equality, there are still areas where we need to improve. Um, and they spoke about the fact that we need to look into having more projects and events to promote inclusivity. Um, so here, what came through strongly was the whole issue of us ensuring that we have uh, an accessible and an inclusive campus uh, when it comes to uh, equity and institutional culture. Student awareness, again, the whole issue of um, scheduling, that is your booking system, uh, that was always full, um, and there are suggestions uh, that they did kind of, uh, we, we, we develop students that are solution focused. So they will complain and complain, and they will say, this is what we are recommending. And we have really applauded our students for that. Um, they spoke about community engagement. This one came through as a, a very positive, they like community engagement. They don't know when it died. Um, then with regards to career, the career center, they feel that more could be done, more career day, maybe more career fair. And I'm happy to say, by the way, Prof. Suri, today we have your career fair. That is your, your accounting career fair. Um, they spoke about, uh, you know, programs that will uh, promote uh, employability. Uh, and uh, yeah, those are the solutions when it comes to student employability and prospects. And as I was sitting there, the SRC reminded me that also we must not only prepare our students for employability, entrepreneurship must come to the, to the fore as well. So that's something we need to look into. Review of existing goals uh, as a team, uh, we focused on goal two and goal six specifically. Um, as much as we said, we will change the suggested there. Um, uh, on second thought, we thought maybe this goal needs to be separated from the DBC's goal that she presented. Maybe we must have our own goal that really speaks to uh, student experience. Uh, because really, at the end of the day, if ours were, we are struggling to retain students, it means we need to elevate you know, uh, the student experience uh, strategy. And also, with regards to goal six, we didn't provide any change. Um, looking at goal two, this is how we kind of uh, draft our suggestions. The current objective, as you can see, um, is there. And we are suggesting uh, it. I, 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 on the next, next slide, I'll go on to the, I'll discuss it, I'll speak to each uh, objective that you are suggesting. But on that side, we are giving reasons in terms of why do we think these um, objectives of, or goals must be revised. So I won't, uh, I won't go into that. We can always read that uh, during our spare time. Uh, the goal, as I said, that we're focusing on is that one. The DVC spoke very nicely about how that one needs to change but we are suggesting more change DVC. Let's separate the two so that it is clear where we are going. Uh, so that things can start flowing and flowing as per Prof. Suri. The first objective we are bringing to the fore. If we are saying let's provide an environment that is conducive for living and learning to open and resident students to personal growth, for personal growth and academic success. The reason we are mentioning OPDEN, uh, if you remember in the past, we just said to, to, for all Rhodes University students, there's a misconception out there that um, OPDEN students feel that we are not supporting them enough. And we felt like if they are mentioned here, that will give them a sense of belonging. And then therefore, in terms of the strategic, strategic objective, we said we must pro 
provide efficient and responsive support services to obedient students. The second one is to enhance student safety on campus for obedient all, on campus and for the obedient all. You see again, we're mentioning the obedient. Then in terms of obedience, again, it says we need to ensure the residents receive the conducive living and learning space. Um, we can probably then also add the obedience hall. We need to provide a high quality service in the residence system, including the dining hall. This is they all based on the suggestion that uh, we received from students. Those are the operational priorities and in terms of the performance indicators, as you can see, we need to have annual student satisfactory survey. We need to ensure that we have a reduced number of, inc of incidences and that we need to ensure that we look at, at, at those reports on a quarterly basis. Um, and uh, in terms of the annual quality survey, that one is what focuses on the residence system. And we need to ensure uh, the, 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 the annual student satisfaction survey came through very strongly as something we can use to measure student satisfaction. Um, the second objective that we are suggesting under goal two is to increase or improve performance, access to sports and recreational facilities for all students. The reason we are suggesting this objective is because in the past, uh, in the past, in the last IDP, sports was just mentioned in passing. We think if we were to attract more students and keep them at Rhodes University, we need to prioritize sports at Rhodes University. Those are the two strategic, strategic objectives that you are putting forward. We need to improve the infrastructure, the sporting facilities to provide high quality fit for purpose facilities. Um, we need to enhance the performance of our sports uh, team through the recruitment of quality athletes. As we are speaking about the recruitment, we need to ensure that we include sports in our recruitment processes. And obviously those are the performance indicators. Um, then again, still under sports, we need to increase participation in sports by increasing scholarship bursaries and awards. A uh, number of scholarship, uh, scholarships awarded will be a performance indicator. We need to host more recreational, recreational sports um, uh, events uh, to encourage wellness on campus. Um, that one would entail measuring the number of interreg events held annually. We need to ensure that sports facilities and codes are accessible to all of those university students, including students living with disabilities. So we need to ensure that uh, students that, are, that live with disabilities are also catered for in sport. Uh, we need to raise awareness about the various sport codes available at Rhodes University, which, by the way, is a strong point for us. I mean, we have 30 sports codes, and any student that comes to Rhodes has an opportunity to take part in sports. Um, objective three, under goal two, still, we are suggesting that this ob objective three, we need to offer holistic, not just holistic, the, 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 the services must be responsive and responsive psychosocial support to all Rhodes University students. How are we going to do that? Number one, we need to strengthen our ability to offer quality counseling and career advice services in the response to student needs. Um, operationally, we need to design focused initiatives. In terms of measuring that, we can look at the percentage of the number of students seeking ass assistance attended to. And our aim is to ensure that 100% of students that are seeking counseling services are healthy. So uh, the waiting list must fall. Uh, we need to run awareness campaigns about mental health and counseling services. We had a very successful one uh, last week. We need everyone agree that we need to do more of that. Uh, we need to modernize all our student services. We need to move with times. Um, then we need to develop and maintain cutting edge facilities that enhance the student experience. 
That is basically objective three for us. Objective three still continues. Uh, focusing um, on career services, this one, we need to ensure that we provide not just career development, effective career development and employability services to our students. That one, I think, is open to discussion. If I, I, we can look at how we can bring in the area of entrepreneurship. Um, we need to provide effective health and wellness programs to students, and that really speaks to the services that we provide in terms of um, physical support, and that would be your healthcare center services, your doctors, and all that. Um, also here, all students that are sick, they need to be helped. Um, then, still under goal two, we have a fourth objective. We need to provide comprehensive and coherent leadership development opportunities and responsible citizens. This is speaking to leadership development, uh, and we only came up with one strategic objective, but we need to, by, so what we're suggesting is that we need to create an enabling and an empowering institutional culture to facilitate student leadership. And uh, there are the suggestions and how we can measure this. Uh, we need to ensure that we provide, you know, more leadership training, uh, we need to award our students who have done well in terms of leadership. Suggestion from my industry is that let their transcripts be endorsed when they have been part of uh, uh, the SRC. I thought you were going to Objective five. Still undergoing to, I'm almost there. We want to foster, foster a culture that is speaking to equity and institutional culture. We want to foster a culture that promotes diversity, equity and inclusion through belonging and engagement. The integration of first years to Rhodes University is very important. We need to ensure, to ensure that we provide an orientation program that is balanced. Um, what came through the surveys strongly is that the students also feel that we've taken away a lot of activities that speaks to their social awareness as they arrive at Rhodes University. And just to remind everyone that we don't have a mountain, nor do we have a sea, but we have student experience, so we need to enhance this one. Then another object, strategic objective under Objective 5 is to enable the creation of a cosmopolitan university which would advance a culture of tolerance, acceptance, respect for differences, diversity, and inclusivity. I'm sure you have heard about what has been on social media for the past few days. We need to really focus on that area, and we need to ensure that we foster a, a campus or a, an institution that is inclusive of each gender. Um, then, as I said, we focus on goal two and six. In terms of goal six, um, this is what you are suggesting, um, that uh, we need to provide the relevant or appropriate academic, oh, goal, this is what goal six, six is saying. And in terms of strategic objectives, we are suggesting that there must be systems that are put in place to, to ensure that we ex expedite residence facilities, maintenance, backlogs. Again, that is speaking to, it might come across as being operational, but uh, my SRC is here, they said I must tell you what the students told us. Um, then we must ensure that all lecture venues and residences are accessible, accessible to students with disabilities. We have come across, as I said earlier, on the campus, that is not disability friendly, and we need to really ensure that we work on that. On that note, as I said earlier on, student experience is very important. We might not have a mountain, nor do we have a sea, but student experience is what we are supposed to pride ourselves for. Thank you. Really, the, the, the point of uh, this particular session I'm going to do the general research stuff and then 
uh, Professor McKenna will come up and talk about the postgraduate um, areas more specifically. And it's really to look at the kind of steer direction, uh, the kind of work that we've done to see if there's satisfaction around the steer direction. And um, hopefully tomorrow in the breakaway group, um, we can look at some of the targets and uh, put some timelines to those. Is there a thing that I can go track with? Where is that? Thank you so much. I do come from a technical background, but that's my old life. And, uh, <laughs> so the kind of process we followed um, uh, is this one up on the, on the screen. We started off by doing a survey and luckily got in, uh, in before all the other surveys hit the staff and got quite a nice response before everyone got survey fatigue. Um, and I'll have to give a shout out here to Jen Snowball who uh, designed the survey, ran it, chatted to her colleagues, the, the, our colleagues in economics are actually fantastic at this kind of work. And uh, the survey results have exceeded my expectations. There's a lot of work that we can drill down on. In fact, I put it up on the resource uh, Google Drive for those of you who want to drill down on it, and particularly those who are coming to the discussion tomorrow might want to look at that. But really, we're going to pick up many of those drill down aspects in the research committee and the kind of interventions we need to go in, into. But one of the nice things about it is I put the pie chart up. This is cut and pasted on Jen's report. Um, to show the spread of academics um, that responded, and you see it's a really quite a nice spread um, of emerging, developing, and established people, and even a few people who uh, self selected themselves as not research productive. Then we held some um, focus groups that were facilitated. Diana Coma here was one of the facilitators, um, and we hand picked people from those different groups for those focus groups. Um, and that was really to drill down on some of the questions that came out of the survey itself. We invited free format submissions. Thank you to those of you who sent those to me. Also very useful, the Science Faculty Research Committee sent a very substantial one. And if there are any from uh, other research committees, from other faculties, um, I'd welcome that because this, uh, this process of drilling down is going to go on after this weekend and in fact after the, the IDP has been, thank you, after the IDP has been completed because the IDP is of necessity a kind of steering document, not a drilling down intervention document. And then of course we've got the actual data, uh, I'm going to talk to you about some of that. Um, we did some comparative analysis of where we set our original goals, the, uh, the original I or the current IDP goals uh, and our current performance data and we have the scholarly literature because we're a university, that's what we do. So, just to start off talking about some of the things that came out of the survey. Many of the, th many of the, the aspects that the survey highlighted uh, turned out to be validation of what we were already doing. So, uh, nobody said, hey, this university is completely on the wrong track with research, we should throw that all out and do something totally different. So, uh, the thing we were looking for particularly were um, people's enablers and bottlenecks. And so here you'll see that there's broad satisfaction from researchers, in fact, in all of those categories, um, about the institutional direction for research and postgraduate studies, and the kind of support they were getting, and even the kind of facilities they had to work at. There were uh, the obviously isolated issues that they're addressing, but in general, people aren't too upset about that uh, institutional level direction and the institutional level support structures. However, when we got down to um, the departmental level questions, uh, they were all, the responses were all over the place. We clearly have some departments that are very conducive to doing research and very supportive, and some that are just flat not. And so the kind of initiatives we need to put in place going forward are to really look um, at uh, how we get all of our departments and scholarly entities to be supportive of this kind of work and to make this kind of work count. And one of the really big things here, and I know we've talked about this a lot in this university, but one of the really big things is to make sure that all of the aspects of an academic's life are counted as valuable when the load balancing uh, kind of stuff is done in departments. So point number two there needs quite a lot of work. Point number three, 
I like this um, result quite a lot. Uh, researchers producing accredited outputs, by and large correlated with researchers doing alternative things, alternative kind of outputs. And so they're not intention uh, in our institution to any large extent. And in fact, that's really nice to see because often the anecdotal kind of conversation is that they are. You know, people are not doing research because they're busy writing in grocers or doing whatever. And, and it looks like that's not true. And that's actually really important for us because it's important that the serious researchers producing new knowledge also put it out in the public domain. That's what raises our, that's really re raises our reputation as a scholarly university. We're not talking to our peers in the discipline. They know if we're good or useless or not. We are talking to the general public, the parents of future um, students, the future students, and so on. So that's really important. It's also really important because of that point um, that was being made earlier around um, the post-truth era. Uh, that what one of the duties of a university is to kind of address, uh, put new knowledge out that addresses what the truth is. Okay, to say something about early career researchers, because we were really playing to this particular audience more than any, uh, we asked questions about the value of the campus uh, culture, and the campus culture, uh, interestingly, was valued by everybody, but valued a little bit more by the early career researchers, and taken a little bit for granted by the more established people. I thought that was kind of interesting. I was really glad about that, though. Um, but here's something that we really need to work on. There was, a, there was a consistent, this came through in the survey, and quite strongly, uh, will be asked about it, particularly in the focus groups, came through quite strongly, there's a real need for administrative support uh, amongst researchers who don't have it. And we need to figure out ways of doing that, which is going to be a combination of putting institutional level support in, finding out what kind of support people need, and really working with departments who have administrative support to get people to realize that that's not only for counting the undergraduate marks, it's for supporting all scholarly aspects of the department, community engagement, research, and teaching and learning. So that's something we really need to work on. And um, one of the things that we hope that we get out um, of this opportunity of looking at the IDP is to look at the supervision models um, and look more at group and collective supervision models. So we were feeling out whether uh, there was a reception to that amongst researchers. And it turns out that the early career researchers are a bit more receptive to that. And again, some of the established researchers didn't think that was a great idea, they don't really want to change now. Um, but there was more, uh, more support amongst some of the earlier career researchers for, for doing this. And in fact, quite strong support. So that's again something that we need to talk about more, and I think Sue will have something to say about that. Okay, these are not surprises. You can't do research without funding, we know that. So research funding, um, and particularly postgraduate financial aid, I'll come back to that point, um, is still a critical need, and as expected, uh, those with more established research careers um, are more likely to have PhDs, they're more likely to supervise postgrads, and they're more likely to be senior academics. Uh, and I think that's self-evident. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about the data, and this data is in the form of accredited outputs, what the DHET count, that's what's in the performance plan, that's what we get in our um, block grant, and that's what Remy was talking about earlier. It's, it's a big deal for us, but it's not the only thing, of course. Um, when we look at um, the SDGs, when we look at the, 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 the National Development Plan and so on, it's not really only talking about accredited outputs, it talks talking about all those other things um, that are important. But those other things turn out to be a lot more difficult to count. And so I'm counting these, but these are proxies for all the other things. And by the way, I think we do them quite well. So if you read the think piece that's on, online, if you've read it, if you haven't, please read it. Um, it really talks about our position uh, in the Eastern Cape and about why we can get away with calling ourselves a research intensive university in a rural setting, the only one. Um, so please have a look at that. But if you have a look at this, um, these accredited outputs, you'll see that the story is quite nice. It's gone up over time. It went up at one stage. 
um, in you know, 2010 up to 2015 or so, it went up really steeply. That's where we pulled from, we were never at the back, but um, you know, somewhere in the middle to pretty much the front. But now we've slowed off a little bit. And I'm going to make a point of this because this is a really, a really critical area for us to look at. So that top blue line there is the overall accredited outputs, research thesis outputs plus our uh, publications. And it's broken down in those bottom three lines to those, the, the, the three elements that make it up. And you'll see the red line there is accredited outputs. That's mostly journal outputs. We are very good at that at Rhodes University. And you can see that's gone up quite nicely. And <coughs> the yellow line there is PhDs, a consistent upstream there too. We've done really quite well with increasing our PhD outputs. And the, I don't know if that's gray or silver. Let's call it silver. The silver lining is actually not great. That's the master's degrees. Look what's happened. We were on a nice climb for a while, and we haven't quite bombed, but it's not only flattened out, it's gone down. So, and this is, this is slightly different to the numbers that um, Remy was showing you earlier. He was showing you enrollments. I'm showing you graduations. So for, for research output, we care about graduations. We don't care about enrollments. But it kind of tells the same story. We're in trouble there. And we need to find out why we're in trouble there, and we need to fix it. And I'm going to come back to that in a moment. The main reason we're in trouble there, I think, is because there's almost uh, no postgraduate that doesn't need finances. And the statutory finances for postgraduates have uh, slowed down from statutory sources I'm talking about, not from all sources, from statutory sources. So the big, big source has always been the NRF. The numbers there have been squeezed significantly. The Water Research Commission, actually they don't give postgraduate uh, bursaries anymore. What about MISFAS? They used to give postgraduate bursaries. They don't give postgraduate, only, for only first degrees now, not even LLBs um, and so on. And so the opportunities we've had for statutory funding for postgraduates have squeezed incredibly and we have not kept up with, I mean I think we've done quite well with other sources of funding but we've not kept up with what we need to, and we're not going to fix that, I don't think, unless we can fix the funding. So I think that's quite important. Um, having a look at uh, the accredited research arm of our faculty, this is always quite nice to see. Um, the science faculty uh, maintains its lead, of course, but the other faculties have come up significantly, particularly humanities and education. So humanities is that red line there, and you see we went through quite a steep climb at one stage. And that's because we put a whole lot of effort into humanities, because they're our biggest faculty, they're the most people. And so we had a lot of interventions, and I really have to credit um, Jane Roberts here for running most of those. There were a lot of uh, interventions specifically aimed at enabling people in the humanities to get their research off, put up, get their research groups together, and we can see the results of that. We've had um, several, uh, several of those uh, initiatives have turned out really well. Uh, basically, we've, we've got a few SARTI chairs out of them, um, and many other others as well. Um, the education one you can see is flattened off. Education is one of the areas where master students have um, have seen a, a little bit of a, a dip down. And um, despite the fact that their research output has remained quite good, uh, that green line there is education, so they work with by that particular aspect. Okay, now some of you will be sick to death of the slide. I show it every time I get the opportunity, and I start slowly showing it in 2008, as you can see. And I think this is the biggest thing for research at this university that we have to work on. And we have been working on it ever since I've been at UBC, and we've made inroads, but man, it's been a hard job. So what this graph is showing is individuals accredited outputs on average annually, our annual average output. And you can see that we've got some superstars on this end. Does this uh, make a... No, it doesn't do that. On the far end, we've got some superstars and the um, productivity output drops off unbelievably quickly. And you all know the superstar is right on the, your left-hand side. Um, and so our, our mission has been to try and lift this tail. All we have to do is lift the tail a little bit, because the tail is long, just a little bit. And you can see we've done that. 
But man, you've got to kind of go and spread your fingers and open it up to see that. We've battled to lift it um, to just get more people into that higher productivity bracket. So you can see that the blue line, the light blue line at the bottom was 2008. Six years later, 2014, we've kind of lifted it. Well, that was quite a nice lift, actually, the best lift, because you can see that in 2008 when we got to about 129 or something, after that we were pretty close to zero output. And by 2014, to get close to zero output, we had to go to about 250. So, I mean, we've got that, that involvement in research spread a lot more widely in the university, and the red line is the most recent one, 2020 um, accredited outputs. But you can see that's a massive challenge, and that's one of our, um, that's still the challenge. I think we still have to work on that um, and try and just lift the end. We can't expect those people over the other side to do any more. They're exhausted. Okay, here's another challenge that we have. Um, the number of staff with PhDs, this is real bottleneck. I mean, our challenge in lifting that, the tail end of that previous graph is that we need capacity. And as it turns out, the capacity is where the PhDs are. It doesn't mean that everybody with a PhD is research productive, that's not true. And it doesn't mean that there are people without PhDs who never research productive. Of course, we get anomalies on both sides of that fence. But by and large, the correlation with where the PhDs are is where the research comes out is true. And so what we've been trying to do is find every way we can to get the proportion of staff at Rhodes with PhDs up. And you can see it's kind of gone okay. It's been a battle as well. Uh, we were that, uh, was that 2010, we were sitting at 50%, actually that's 51%, uh, but that doesn't matter. And we've managed over that long period of time, 10 years, to get up to 63%. So we're sitting at 63% of our full-time permanent academic staff have PhDs now. Um, and if we want to be this research university that is distinctive as that we believe, we believe we can be, we really need to get that number up a little bit more. I'll show you that in absolute values. That's what's happened over that period of time. Um, I particularly wanted to show this because I think there's a perception that the number of academics at Rhodes has gone down. It hasn't, it's gone up, it went up quite steeply at one, one stage. Um, but we weren't able at that time to, um, to keep the number of PhDs going up at the same rate. And you'll see we kind of need to squeeze that, that, that distance between the two graphs um, close as much as we can. Of course we can't keep it entirely closed. There are disciplines where that's not going to happen. We've got professional areas in the university um, where it's unrealistic to say everyone has to have a PhD. And we all know people in the university who don't have a PhD and would fall on the floor and sob if they were to leave because they are such fantastic contributors. Um, so there are all kinds of anomalies. But in general, it would be a mistake for us not to be worried about that and do more and more to um, get those graphs closer together. And I think when we talked about the previous um, version of the IDP, we were talking about um, over a period of time, not, not as short as now, but over a period of time looking at getting to 75%. And I think that's attainable, but we're going to do quite a few things um, to achieve that. So here are our um, primary SWOT uh, items. We think that the primary strength is our, our culture, our scholarly culture. Rhodes University has made its name on the scholar-teacher model. The fact that the person who goes into the first year class is a scholar and um, in fact we we don't have the kind of economies of scale to use any other kind of model we are stuck with the scholar teacher if you want to be a research university the teachers have to do the research because we can't afford um, dedicated researchers um, so and that's really worked for us and we've got inspiring role models we've got some amazing role models um, some of our researchers um, you know to say they're literally world famous is a cliche that were literally world famous people. And you know, we bump into them in pick and pay. That's incredible. What's our primary weakness? Well, I think our primary weakness um, is our research capacity. If we want to improve, we can't expect the people who go in full speed to go faster. We need more people doing that. So we've really got to work on our PhD 
PhD qualifications across the board. Then we go down to our primary threat. Our primary threat is funding postgraduates. Um, we want to actually become more of a postgraduate university. We can't just say we're open for business. Obviously, we've got to advertise, we've got all kinds of things to do, um, but one of the things we've got to be able to say is if you're a good quality postgraduate, here's a scholarship you're in. We have to be able to get that right. That's going to be very hard for us. What about primary opportunities? Well, quite a bit of discussion on this one. Um, we think um, collaborative communities of scholarship are probably where we're going to get our biggest bang going into the future. We think this is important for postgraduates um, so that we don't have this lonely postgraduate thing. I'm going to leave Sue to talk about that a little bit more. Um, it's really important for early career researchers to be part of a community that's bigger than just a Makanda. And really, really important, we know that statutory funding, if it's not going down, is at least leveling off. We've got to go for international funding. And you can't just go as a little lonely researcher and say to the UK RR or somewhere like that, I need some money. You've got to be part of a big consortium. That's how it works. So getting ourselves involved in big consortia is the recipe for successful international research that's funded that way. It's the, it's the grown-up league. So that's a big, and we've got some of those. We've got some very, very successful international consortia memberships um, that are working fantastically. I think that's the name of the game going forward. Okay, so if you look at the view of the existing goals um, in the research area, goal three, of course, is the one. And we obviously want to retain that goal because now we've agreed that it's in um, pretty much in our mission and vision, so we look stupid to suggest changing that. But that's not the only one. To, to maintain and grow research at this university, we have to look at all of the other areas. We can't do it just for research. Um, so all of these are important, and we've got to look at in, uh, um, we've got to we've got to look at the kind of goals that will support research and scholarship in every aspect um, of what we do, and we'll talk about those obviously in the breakaways. Okay, so just quickly to go through um, the areas that we have on the table for the current IDP, and to just tick off um, where we've done it and where we haven't. Uh, the first uh, objective there was to broaden the research output quality and research productivity level of academic staff. I'll show you that that's, uh, that's a graph already. Uh, yes, we've done it, but um, when we wrote that down, we honestly thought we were going to do better than we did. So we've done it, but um, I don't think we can pat ourselves on the back. There's quite a lot of work to be done there uh, still. The objective doesn't change. Some of our um, bold and ambitious, what was that saying? Some of our objectives um, that are bold and ambitious um, have to be changed in the interventions that we put in place. Identify areas of scholarly excellence. Actually, we've done that quite nicely. Um, the Saatchi chairs, the research focus areas, Sandisi and Beiru has had fantastic results in, in, in some places where we've um, deployed that. And initiatives like that have worked quite well for us. And so we've um, been able to raise new areas of scholarship at the university that are now essentially internationally important. And that's really what we're aiming at doing. Grow and maintain excellent research infrastructure. Well, there are still some gaps that are now, but the interesting thing about the survey is um, there were very few that didn't think that the infrastructure at the university was great. So um, there's quite a lot of satisfaction um, about our research infrastructure. We do have some serious gaps though. I'll mention just one to you. Um, replacing very expensive scientific equipment that, that breaks down. We have no fund when our, one of our major machines uh, breaks down and needs a huge part. Um, so that's always been a real challenge and we need to address that, let alone uh, the, the cost of capitalizing um, you know, multi-billion rand equipment. Instill and grow a research culture that fosters innovation, um, relevance, I think that's meant to be, uh, innovative, innovative, sorry, relevant to challenging research. Um, and I've talked about this already. It's um, more valued by the emerging researchers, which is interesting. One of our challenges was to grow the number of postdocs. Uh, we can tick this off. Obviously, we still have to work on postdocs. 
but we hit 100 postdocs on this campus for the first time in 2020, um, which is actually great. Okay, amongst the new strategies, a lot of what we have to do, I think, is in the postgraduate area. Uh, so this is my last slide, and I will hand over to Sue at the end of this, so you can start getting out of your chair, Sue. Um, but we'll talk about this and try and put timelines onto them uh, tomorrow. But we really need to improve our promotion, the ways we promote um, the fact that we are a scholarly university. We don't see ourselves in the news enough, I don't think. And now that we know that there isn't this tension between alternative and accredited outputs, I think we can relax about that and say, spend some time on that, everybody. And then we really need to look at some of our HR processes and um, how we've been using them in the past, whether we can use them um, in a more uh, sustainable way in terms of our capacity. Um, because we did go through an, an area where we weren't looking at that. We're looking at it quite carefully now. Um, and uh, we need to perhaps do it on a departmental level. The question really being, uh, how many developmental candidates can a small department uh, afford operation to carry those sorts of things? and not simply do it on a case-by-case -case basis, because on a case-by-case -case basis, you get yourself into the kind of trouble where you've got more people away doing their PhD than you've got here in the classroom, and obviously we need to keep a balance around that. So we'll talk about some of those things in the breakaway too. And with that, I'll hand over to Sue. Sue, you've got 10 minutes. Hi everyone, 10 minutes, how many? 20 slides, no. Um, I'll, I'll be as quick as I can. Um, I actually have printed out, I didn't, uh, I don't really printed these out, I've printed out a lot of what I'm going to present, so it is all in the folder as well, but if you want to grab one of these, if I don't get through everything. Um, so I'm going to be focusing on postgraduate education, and importantly, focusing on recruitment, retention, and time to completion. I'm going to start off with the issues of retention and time to completion. Um, we have missed our targets, Peter said, you spoke about this. We've missed our targets in terms of postgraduate um, enrollment for the last couple of years. It is actually a, a national picture and it's an international picture. And I think COVID is obviously a big part of that. But it, it, it is nonetheless a worry. Um, and I think it's important to note that across the sector, only half of South African doctoral students, I'm focusing here on the doctorate, and in fact you'll see throughout the presentation that a lot of the research is on the doctorate, but a lot of the lessons we learn from the research is, can be used to try and make sense of masters as well. So across the sector in South Africa, only half of all candidates complete a doctorate within six years. That's not far off the international picture, by the way. Um, and alongside this very slow time to completion, though, we have a real problem with high dropout in South Africa. That is, is a, real, a real issue. Um, and about half of all of our, our doctorates in, in the country drop out. Clearly a problem. You need to look at that alongside the reality that 60 to 70 percent of doctoral candidates are part-time and a huge percentage of our master's candidates are part-time as well. And that, we know that time to completion is longer for people who are part-time, but we also know from the literature that the need for more structure and the need for more support is greater with part-time students and yet they get less structure and support. Um, in terms of time to completion, if you look at that, we're not doing too badly. We certainly do better than the national average, That's, but, but this is, comes from our doctoral review. But bear in mind that this is, this is how long it takes for people to graduate. It doesn't include the students who dropped out. Um, I'm not going to talk, I see, as Peter was saying, we're not actually 63%, um, but of course much less if you take the contract people into account, by the way. Um, it's, if we, if we have indeed hit 63%, that's great, then we're on target, which we said we'd hit 63% by 2022. It's much less than the um, target for 2030. The national target is that all universities must have 75% as a research intent, so we should presumably be much more than 75%. Um, but we are above the national average, which is that only 46% of academics in South Africa have um, doctorates, but then again, that includes URTs who never had that requirement. 
Um, something that came out of the review, uh, when we had the doctoral review, one of the things our panel warned us is they said that out of your 264 academics with doctorates, only 192 are supervising at doctoral level. Now again, as Peter said, not everyone needs to do everything, and there are often good reasons for exceptions, but they certainly suggested that this is something for us to consider. Um, and so, as Peter said, we need to make renewed <coughs> efforts at increasing the proportion of staff with PhDs. And this means thinking carefully about recruitment and, um, at, the point of, uh, at the time of appointment, thinking about retention strategies. We've often expended a lot of time, energy, support on people who then get their doctorates and move on. And to think about the ways in which we support people busy with their doctorates. These are the big questions I'm hoping we can really work through um, for the rest of the time we're together, which is what do we want the postgraduate student experience to look like, and what is it, is it that makes the university an intellectually vibrant, research-rich environment where they will be nurtured to flourish? So what would it look like to be a student coming into our campus? And the literature actually tells us a lot about what it takes to make sure that people get stay in a postgraduate degree and graduate. And the literature, and here in particular, I've just completed a very big project that I've done with uh, uh, Susan van Skalpek, uh, Deputy Dean of Medicine at Stellenbosch University. And the two of us looked at all the literature, basically, 1,800 and something articles between 10, 2010 and 2021, and we, that, that mentioned doctoral education in any country and in any field. And it's very clear that in every single country that we looked at, there is a move towards more structure and more collaboration. Um, the drivers were different, but the main aim was always to increase retention and lower time. It looked different in different places, different contexts, so I've got just got some examples of what it looked like in the literature, but this move towards more structure and more collaboration in a curriculated way at postgraduate level was absolutely uniform. In some countries, China, Russia, Kenya, it's legislated, it's state required now. I'm not suggesting you go that route, um, the DHET has left the room. Um, <laughs> but the examples of more structure and collaboration included things like seminars and presentations. We've got some brilliant examples of that happening. Real, um, real communities of students that are not one-on-one, -on -one. they're not lonely scholars, they're joining a community. But in very few cases are these curriculated. In other words, when you join the program, program this is your program. Every Monday, lunchtime, you're in a seminar. Every Friday, you're in your tutorial group discussing your research. Every Wednesday, you're in a reading group. These were curriculated part of the program. The second one was a huge factor in time to completion, specified milestones. A lot of people coming in, especially full thesis masters and doctorates, how long, what am I meant to be doing? Where am I in this job of, of, of getting this qualification? Other milestones clearly articulated, specified, and tracked. Coursework is a big one. High frequency project meetings, including supervisors. Funding for four years um, instead of three. It's having a seven year outer limit for registration. Curriculated community engagement opportunities. So if you come and you do this masters, it includes a community engagement opportunity as part of the curriculum, or in many other cases, industry internships. Study abroad opportunities. Um, and exchange opportunities. I think it's important to note that we've got examples of almost all of those things already on campus, but are we making that a very common norm wherever it fits? I'm never a believer in one size fits all, but I think there's so many opportunities that we are just sitting on and we're not actually implementing them widely and sharing our ideas widely enough. So I think that this whole move, this international move towards more structure and collaboration is a real opportunity and we should be grabbing it. Um, and I think it's important to note that national reports from way back in 2009 right to this report now in 2022, over and over again, national reports have come out and said, guys, you've got to break with your colonial past. The Oxbridge model doesn't work. It's important to note that in the UK, which is where the Oxbridge model come, comes from, it continues <coughs> being used, but it's the minority model. What do I mean by the Oxbridge model? It's got many names, one-on-one -on -one model, um, uh, master-apprentice model. It's not to say that you can't have that model, 
Many of the examples I showed you earlier still retained that model, but they curriculated additional support, seminars, short courses, opportunities to collaborate, presentation opportunities. So I'm not suggesting anyone give up your, oh, but I like to work with an individual student, but that you're part of a program with clear structure. In some cases, it was completely done away with. There were panels, project teams, and so on. But in many cases, keep that model. But where it's the one-on-one -on -one model, the research in South Africa shows that the average humanities and social science student, that includes economic, I mean that includes um, commerce, law, education, the average humanities and social science students gets two hours of supervision a month. That's what the research in South Africa shows. If they are not augmenting that with regular opportunities and expectations, there's a real problem. That's taken from Jen Snowball's um, research that she did, and that was the question that was mentioned earlier. You know, are we ready for this? Is this something we should go for? Most people said yes. Most people said, let's, let's think about it. Um, the benefits are multiple. I won't go through them all. Um, you can see it on the handout. I'm seeing that Noel is sort of standing there hovering. Okay, moving on, moving on. Coursework. The HEQSF, by the way, says that you can't have coursework in a traditional doctorate for credit. It doesn't say you can't have it. Church will have had coursework for years in our PhD. Um, but the, the recommendation is that that gets changed. Are we going to be ready for the change in legislation that's coming? Are we ready for that? Okay, um, moving on, moving on, you can read it. I really think someone said earlier that opportunities of online courses, especially for international students in humanities and social sciences, I think we are sitting on an incredible opportunity to have structured online masters and PhD programs. I like blended programs. I think there's something important about students coming onto campus once or twice a year for a few days to feel like they're part of the body. Uh, and leaving it there. We need to get better at looking after our postdocs. We've got really good at getting more postdocs, but we aren't, we haven't yet, I think, got a very clear sense of what they're here for and who they're part of and what support is there available. I think that I will leave it there. Thanks for, thanks for keeping to the time. One of the norms we agreed to, Lazuka, was concise decision making, right? So we've got two choices. Either we can continue with the next two sessions, or we can take a 15 minute coffee break. Hands up for coffee break? Yes. Okay, I think that's the majority. <laughs> take it 25 past, please. Engagement and social responsibility to action our vision and mission. And I now call upon you, Di, to give us some ideas as to re-envisaging and reimagining the future with regards to that. I'm very happy that I don't have to compete with tomorrow's rugby. <laughs> afternoon is going well colleagues. Um, the session now as you see is the working group report back for community engagement and social responsibility and uh, there were three of us convening this uh, myself and for those who don't know me Diane Hornby from community engagement, Sakin Kraveza and he's the manager of Circle of Unity and Prof um, Cyril Mbata who is the ICR director. So the three of us, and we had the help of Ashton Dingle as our research person. So what I'm gonna, what we're gonna do with you, uh, talk to you this morning, uh, this afternoon about, is I'll give you a little bit around the context, um, and then we will share with you around our working group discussions. Uh, what emerged from that, the key findings, and then the SWOT analysis, what we think is a strength, a weakness, um, an opportunity and a threat for community engagement. Then we're going to review the goals, see what we um, are proposing to, we we're proposing some small changes, some new strategies, some of which have already started, and then a framework for Rhodes University community engagement. This is something we've developed over a number of years that we want to share with you and see if you have an appetite for um, today. So let me start with the context and then I'm going to ask Saki 
who walked the road with us um, in the discussion groups to share what the feedback was from those. So in terms of the uh, context, a little bit of background, as you all well know by now, after 15 years of having established a community engagement division at Rhodes, community engagement is um, one of three core functions at the university. It comes in alongside teaching and uh, learning and research. And it was introduced in 1997 as the white paper around the transformation of higher education. And it was in, introduced in order to uh, get universities to become more developmental and transformative in their work. So, if you're unsure of the purpose of um, community engagement, I think these last two years with the COVID pandemic was a stark reminder of how important it is to become more responsive and developmental as a university. And we saw a number of our departments stepping up and using the knowledge they generated to help our broader community through um, a very difficult time. Community engagement is not a standalone. It was never designed for that. It needs to be deeply embedded in the academic project. So we need to, uh, we need to work out how through service learning we can enhance teaching and learning and how through engaged research and in particular community-based participatory research we enhance um, research. The purpose of higher education is around the contribution to social and economic research and also around um, the kind of young people that we grow and you often hear the VC speak around this and you've heard it spoken about often today already around the holistic development of young people. Not everything they need to learn uh, to cope with life, they're going to learn between the four walls of a lecture theater. So how do we create spaces outside of that that complements the academic project but at the same time contributes to the social and economic development of our community. So we need to think about how we shift away from the traditional models of higher education um, to seeing ourselves as part of a community. And you will be reminded by the Vice Chancellor's inaugural speech in 2015 when he said we are, this university is not only geographically located in Makanda, it is of and for. So that's the journey is to find out, is to find how do we contribute to the public good? How do we contribute to the social and economic development of our community um, while um, enhancing that academic uh, project? Um, I'm going to ask Saki now to take us through the data that we collected from the five stakeholder group. This was quite extensive. Um, the community partner group, we had two sessions. Um, and then we worked with the municipal and government departments. We had 50 representatives out for that. Uh, we had 26 students and we chose students that were team leaders in the community engagement space. We have 117 team leaders who help us manage uh, the volunteer of the community engaged learning programs at Rhodes. So we selected from them um, to come and contribute. And then we got, um, we had a group of 15 academics and then we also got individual input from them. So I'm going to ask Saki to share that with you. Uh, good afternoon. Oh, wow. sorry, I forget I have a loud voice. Hi, uh, for those that haven't met, my name is Saki Tabizm. I'm the program manager in the Makanda Circle of Unity. Uh, today I seem to have come as the viscerally branded Rhodes mascot, so that's pretty great. Uh, quick plug for the communications department, all of these items are on the online store. <laughs> so as Di mentioned, there were a series of quite extensive discussions in uh, working groups that we held with different structures between the 4th and the 18th of July. Uh, and what we tried to do is just try and extract uh, very much from the discussion. We brought forward and we used a lot of those spaces as reflection spaces where we introduced the previous existing goals and the process that was followed to set up the expanding IDP. 
and then we encourage a very open and honest discussion space and feedback on how are the programs responsive to the context, are they meaningful, are they helpful, are they engaging, and in what ways we can really nuance and deepen the university's participation and uh, the existing community engagement projects. So on community partner organizations, we had two different sessions with them, and some of the key feedback notes was that there was a real hunger and desire to strengthen and build upon existing community and university partnerships. Uh, and to exemplify that, one idea that came up was that of potentially even having a situation where the Rose University Library uh, were to take up one of the libraries that exist in Makanda and help to co-manage and set it up and build on the structural scaffolding uh, in order to then further imbue the standard of excellence and educational excellence in Makanda. Um, one interesting opportunity that comes from that though is that can also become a lovely access point for opposite students that live in Makanda East and Jaws aside. So by helping to build that library for the community, you also create an avenue point for existing Rose University students. Um, there was big support and a bigger desire, I think, to strengthen and build upon the psychosocial crisis interventions across that area. I know the psychology department's been doing quite a lot of work to, to build on that, and there's a real hunger to respond to that as a challenge that's being faced. Uh, community partners spoke very, very uh, effusively about a desire and need to see if we could build upon uh, very purposeful and intentionally engaged research for Makanda. Uh, I know that the Community Engagement Office has developed a research bank where they invite their partners to submit topics and areas of interest and relevance to them, and then they will try and uh, connect those topics and those ideas with relevant uh, academics within the institution. Uh, but part of that is that this idea of building on this pattern and principle of engaged research uh, and the intentionality behind it is, is, is really exciting for our partners. And also the idea of exploring the schools that exist in the space as centers of research is also quite important. The point of access came up in different groups altogether. I think in every single group that we had a conversation with. But in particular from our community partners, it was access in terms of finding ways to build on what, on, on, on the organic skills that they've, that they've got and some of their skill sets and how to fill gaps. So one of the areas that was raised was it would be great if the university could find ways to assist with the recognition, the RPO, the recognition of prior learning, um, availing and making an accessible variety of short courses to help build on people's knowledge sets, and finding if there are any ways of, of facilitating apprenticeship type opportunities on campus. And uh, one member even went as far as to say, even if you could allow for some of the community members to come in and just shadow someone in their capacity, their position, to start to garner a bit of an understanding of how different jobs are done. Uh, the idea of the repository came up, and I know this has also been raised by different academics in the space, which is to create one central point that captures, I'm going to try to summarize this in a nutshell, uh, as much information about who's doing what in the space and in what way it can help build and nuance what's happening in the community. So if there's a member who's really interested in how the university is tackling the matter of uh, SDG go around poverty, uh, you find a space for that and when you put it up, you get to see every department and faculty that's doing work around that and the type of accessible information they could pull for that to build for their own programs. Um, one other point that came up is that of local procurement for community economic development. Partners felt that the university should try and explore increasing ways of procuring products and services from within Makanda um, and, 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 and the industry so obviously facilitate deeper economic development. And then finally, the issue of connectivity and digital access across Makanda East uh, came up again as a real priority, as a developmental priority too, uh, for schools and learners to use. With the municipal partners that we consulted with, um, there were three really big subsets that came up. The first was there was a, seemed to be a desire to highlight the existing. Oh, sorry, am I clear? Oh, it's too close. Oh, I'm sorry again. <laughs> there was a real desire to sort of. Um, uh, formalize the partnerships that exist with different departments in the institution uh, in the form of uh, perhaps either having MOUs or signed contracts. And this correlates with something that Dr. Ndozi raised this morning in the IDP progress report and sort of reflecting that perhaps the real approach or question that needs to be answered is, is there value in formalizing or having some sort of contractual agreement around those relationships within state departments? The question of access came up in this regard because state partners kept reflecting that from their perspective, the university isn't adequately or meaningfully advertised the variety of projects and initiatives it's running. And because of that, there's no knowledge of the work being done, and therefore the easy assumption is that the university is not an active stakeholder responding to the crisis points in the city. Uh, and then the matter of having study opportunities for officials came up, 
and specifically they spoke to the challenge of um, if a government official is looking to do a short course or further adult education, they can't access any short courses on campus, so they'll go to Quebec, uh, they'll go to uh, East London, and it would be ideal to find or create a situation where the university provides access to those types of courses for them as well. From the students that were uh, discussed with, uh, one thing that came up, and I think also the community partner shared this, was that the model that the Rose University Community Engagement Office uses is of such value that it would be good to introduce it to the different schools to sort of introduce the idea of community engagement from a young age. And even the community partners said the same thing that have worked with the model that don't just work with us but also show us your model so we can help it carry through in different spaces. Uh, the students also shared that it, it, from their experience it seems very important and valuable that all students in the university should have some other kind of community engagement experience on campus before they graduate. I know how this speaks to what you're saying in the slide. Um, and the one interesting point for me that stuck out is that they reflected on how their experience in undergrad doing community engagement projects actually helped enrich them when they got to postgraduate studies. It, it, it helped develop a deeper understanding and capacity to respond to some of the deeper thematic and theoretical challenges they encounter. Uh, the concept of using community engagement uh, as a key marketing strategy for the university came up quite strongly in this space. Students felt that the university could start to sell itself on the basis and strength of the existing community <coughs> engagement projects that are run. And uh, again, a big request and desire just to have some sort of recognition of the time, effort, and learnings that they, they got from the experience of on community engagement on their respective uh, transcripts because this <coughs> obviously heightens the employability. One reference point was also to note that in the, the rest of the world, in some spaces, uh, one's experience doing community-centered projects often lends credence to the application for further funding and access to uh, uh, study. And yes, we'll cover all that. And then from the academics, and you see there are some natural correlations between what's said by academics who were interviewed alongside community partners and students. Uh, they asked that it would be very useful to have a research repository to get a sense of who's doing what research in what area and how community wants to be strengthened. Um, a big call to, to try and start promoting transdisciplinary research, a call to, for the community engagement practice and also affirming that the practice of doing the work that's done here actually does contribute to curriculum transformation in the space and it's important to highlight and underpin that. Um, there was affirmation that the activities that are done with the communities are aligned with the social justice and imperatives of the institution and the guiding documents we use. Uh, and the community university partnership developments uh, allowed them to create more opportunities for engaged research and to strengthen the service learning in the institution. Uh, and then finally, the few, last few points was that there was a call to obviously try and strengthen the community engagement, in, uh, engagement and participation and activity at faculty departmental levels. There was a request for there to be orientation for new staff members, particularly those who come from outside of Makanda, into what the greater Makanda context is. Very interesting point was a suggestion that perhaps the Rhodes University Community Engagement Office should play some other kind of lobbying or advocacy role, um, be it at the provincial or national level. And this was also raised in relation to making contributions to policy documents, to bills that are gazetted by the government. The community partners, interestingly enough, have also then said that the university should play a role of that age itself by convening and gathering members of the community, gathering insights, and submitting a consolidated Makanda or Makana uh, input into those bills. Uh, that point, though, uh, is a very interesting one. And then the final one was just to underline, I'd like to think, that the community engagement project should remain deeply aligned to the sustainable development goals. Mangdai, do you want to do this one? Or should I? Oh. Okay. Um, and then we follow through with the instruction of having um, a singular point for each of uh, the strengths and weakness, the opportunities and threats that we sort of extracted from the discussion. One of the big strengths that came through is that um, the Vice Chancellor, the Deputy Vice Chancellor, and the Executive of the University do demonstrate uh, strong support for the social responsibility of the students, for the community and academics, through the support group available to the community engagement projects and the various community centered initiatives that exist in the university, such as the MCU and ISA. One weakness identified is that. Structurally, and this relates again to one of the points that came in, in, in the key findings, community engagement as a core function is, is, is making very slow inroads and getting traction at the faculty department to level. So there is a need to try and strengthen that area. The opportunity that's come up though, particularly with the request for a repository, the request for access in more nuanced ways, 
is to then to start to build strong community university partnerships that on one level strengthen the academic project, and another level anchor the university within the space and then thus facilitate a very clear-cut, strong uh, initiative to start to turn the city around from the current circumstances through these programs. And the big threat that came up is <coughs> the hunger for all these projects, you need significant resources and it's hard to give life and lend credence to them with the limited resources available right now. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you, for those that work in the finance space, you'll remember that this was a mandate to introduce community engagement, an unfunded mandate. So funding wasn't increased because um, of the introduction of community engagement. Right, so let's go on to the goals and some suggestions around these. Um, the first thing that needs to be noted here is that community engagement shouldn't have its own goal. It's infused into the university. It's very much embedded in all that we, we do. And that's, you can see evidence of that as I'll speak today. So the first goal, which is around that very important nexus of t uh, research, teaching and community engagement, the black uh, text remains uh, there, which was to provide opportunities for students to participate in theorized initiatives falling along the spectrum of community engagement. The first one was the number of service learning options programs available to students. So we just wanted to add to that to increase the number of academics involved in service learning. So the reason for that was to move away from where situations where one academic runs a service learning project, then when they leave, it, um, it no longer exists. And to encourage departments to get behind service learning programs, so to get more than one person running it. And then that every student experiences community engagement before they leave roads. So currently, we have a 1,000 students who are working volunteer programs weekly. We have another part, one thousand, <laughs> not the great supporter of that area, one thousand five hundred who work in service learning programs. So that's two thousand five hundred uh, uh, of our student body. And then this year we initiated um, the uh, module for first years to introduce them and orientate them to community engagement. And that, in, that added another thousand. So um, we're moving along quite nicely, but if we were to aim for that, I think it would be a really good thing because it's very much part of growing the kind of young student we want to knowledgeable, um, critical thinkers and has a heightened sense of social responsibility. Um, then in goal two, which is the access, um, the, we've done really well in that space. Uh, we've gone from non students from our local schools in 2011 to 138 um, this year. So that's, that's, we've gone really well in that space, but we don't track them further than when they get into the university. And that is something that needs to be um, considered. So just to add to that and add it to 2.4, by uh, increasing the access to roads for learners from local schools by providing academic support programs in local schools and in the adjustment period of their first year to teaching and learning at roads. So just making sure they continue succeeding. Then um, a suggested addition in, in that same uh, goal um, is Oh, no, I've mentioned that, sorry. And then I'll go to goal three. Now this is a, the research uh, goal and we haven't had any um, objectives or performance indicators in that area, although over the years uh, we've worked really hard with the scholarship of engagement and building the research trajectory. We published our first book and this year we've you know, had a number of chapters and papers uh, published. So we've just uh, added a few ideas there, which is the promotion of engaged research in the form of CBPR, which is community-based participatory research, um, which has relevance for community and societal well-being, and the number of local, to increase the number of locally engaged research projects which have mutual benefits. Uh, and the second objective is around um, setting up a Makanda knowledge project uh, to be more deliberate about generating co-creative knowledge on Makanda for the purposes of social and economic development. 
um, the appropriate set of appropriate stru structures to establish and enable this. And then the adequate and relevant resources, um, you know, whether that's soft money or um, to do something within the university. Um, and the reason that we are proposing that is to um, uh, is around research, to encourage research on societal impact um, and community-based participatory research, where we start to respect their knowledge in the community and we co-create with them, as many departments already do. Um, we can go to the next slide, and then in goal five. Um, which is attracting and reaching and retaining a staff of a high calibre. Um, we already have a, a part of the orientation that Churchill runs uh, for, for new staff, but we'd like to do a little bit more, maybe uh, give them a bus trip to some historic sites and introduce them to the whole of uh, Makanda, you know, Grandstone, uh, Makanda East and Makanda West. So it's just um, to extend what is already being done there. And then in goal seven, which is to promote roads as an institution for public good in local, provincial, national, and international context, the strengthening of institutional support of CA faculty level, possibly looking at a standardization of how it's done. It's done really well in some faculties and not as well in others. Um, the establishment of a research uh, portal, so a portal where our community partners and other people can instantly find information in areas they're looking for. I know there's a link to library, but it seems like that interface isn't working as well as it, as it could. And then the promotion of interdisciplinary community university partnerships for the participation in the various forms of community engagement. Um, those currently are service learning, engaged research, and um, community engaged learning or volunteerism, and becoming um, Another one is, is social innovation <coughs> and entrepreneurship, which is growing and getting good traction. We can move on. And then the new strategies, some of which are already in place, um, but still need a lot of work. I'm going to manage, uh, mention four points here. The first is the commitment to building community engagement as a core function and an emerging discipline. Um, we have written a, a course, uh, a postgraduate uh, diploma in higher education community engagement. It's found its way through the university structures and uh, we hope that um, uh, it's, it's, it now goes to SACWA and DHEAD, so, DHEAD, so hopefully it will see its way through there by the end of the year. We only planning to start that in 2024. And then around the theorizing of community engagement, Every volunteer that works in the community first uh, goes through a training program around theories of community engagement and then gets trained in their specific um, the site, the choice of their site. Around. So to keep building those, we already have 12 short courses that are roads accredited. The establishment of a community engagement journal. Most community engagement practitioners will uh, will um, submit their papers to the discipline-specific uh, journals. There isn't a community engagement-specific one. So this is something we're working with the uh, DPC of Research to establish. Um, then the, the engaged research output, which we've already mentioned, and then the repository, which I will get into in a minute. And then the second one, the Knowledge Project with Makanda for Makanda. And this is about enhancing the, um, the participatory approaches to research and also making Makanda a priority. You know, if you have a look at what we've been able to achieve with, uh, in the, the BC's Education Initiative, uh, which has pretty much turned public education around in uh, Makanda, we believe we can do that um, you know, in other sectors in Makanda too. The, every student should have a CE experience at Rhodes. Um, the volunteer space of a thousand students stretches our staff uh, immensely. We wouldn't, as much as we turned volunteers away this year, we wouldn't be able to start uh, another program. So the potential really lies in the, um, in the faculties and departments to grow community engagement. We're doing well with young academics. 
we've gone from 21 service learning programs to just over 40 uh, this year. But um, this, this, the, you know, that's really where the, the growth can take place. Um, the res oh, um, around the recognition of students, uh, there's a lot of work that gets done in uh, at Bruce around student leadership. As I said, we train 117 uh, student leaders every year. They help us to run the five programs. They take on immense responsibilities. We also train to put them through leadership courses, etc. And uh, we need we to start looking around how we recognise them for you know their immense contribution to our community in more meaningful ways. So they get a certificate, but I think we can do better than that. So if we can start putting our heads together to see how we can recognise them, it will make them more employable as well. Then resourcing community engagement. Uh, at the end of this year, we'll have a dedicated space for Roos, which I think is going to really be a lift for us um, to continue the work that we have been doing. And to make the university more porous, we find a lot of community partners come in and off campus now, bringing groups onto campus. We have the Social Innovation Hub. It range, the courses there range from digital storytelling to just computer literacy to try and um, close that big digital divide. But it's a lovely feeling, you know, we're the only one, uh, or one of the few universities that doesn't have a wall all the way around it. Uh, you know, you don't have to stop and be checked at the gate. You just come onto campus and there's a lovely stream of people that comes to community engagement to those offices for various reasons. And um, I think once we have our own dedicated space, that's going to go from strength to strength. And then the funding of CE, 75% um, of our budget we, is soft money we're raising uh, and that's not really sustainable. Uh, recognizing though that uh, the mandate was not a funded mandate. All right, so this is a, a framework that we wanted to present to you today. It's been a three year working project. We. Um, we started off by looking at the various legislative frameworks, the SDGs, the national uh, priorities, the um, ROADS IDP and the ROADS RTP, the transformation uh, policy document. And we looked at how do we align that um, and how do we create a, a visual descriptor of how uh, that that gives life to this idea of being simultaneously locally engaged, uh, locally responsive and globally engaged. Um, the, the process that we followed, we sat down for three days and we worked with those documents and we drew up a matrix to arrive at this. There was nothing haphazard about um, you know, this, this knowledge uh, wheel as we call it. The purpose of it is to bring the um, work we all do into the public domain in an accessible way. Um, it can serve us as a framework, a repository. We've heard through the feedback of all our stakeholders, we want a repository. Where do we access this information, this knowledge that's been generated by the university, etc. So we could, we could build it that it serves as a repository uh, for the knowledge we've generated. Uh, we would hope that much of that knowledge is co-created with the very stakeholders that need it. It will help us to coordinate our, our efforts to address local challenges and the global SDGs. Um, you know, it's not one or the other. It's so important that we, we work in integrated, um, systemic ways of seeing, um, I think it was uh, Ahmed Bauer, who at that engaged conference said to us, he said, you know, focus on the local and build it because that is the knowledge and those are the models you will take onto the global um, uh, stage and stock of knowledge. But he said you will take it on your own terms. And I thought that was quite a powerful comment. So um, it also uh, promotes the integration. So you can imagine the work that you do, where you pop it in there, and if we could build a really good app and have it on our website 
and people could access, access it, it would be um, an amazing uh, resource, I think, for the university. Uh, just one last quick slide. So that was around the, the real vi the visual dis descriptor of how we go from local to global and not mutually exclusive. It's, it really works that, you know, we could put, find a way of putting all the work that's done on Makanda because we want to give that special academic focus on it with the idea of turning Makanda around. But the information we co-generated in that space, we take on to the global space. Thank you. I'd now like to say thank you to the two of you for your presentation. Lovely graphic at the end, by the way, very interesting. And I'm now going to call upon Lawrence. And um, Lawrence headed the working group, which focuses on internationalization and partnership. So, Lawrence, thank you. Over to you. And here's your clicker. University of Institutionalization <coughs> is a decentralized model. And the group agreed that we accept that model and that we make our suggestions based on the understanding that that model is the model that we will have going forward. Because in other universities, um, there are different models of in internationalization. Uh, by that I mean everybody doing different things uh, here and there across the university. So we agreed that all suggestions that we are going to show you here, that we are discussing today and tomorrow, are based on the understanding that that is the model we have and that we must make it work. Secondly, the group also did agree that internationalization is cross cutting and that um, it is not possible, therefore, um, to have a goal on internationalization. And that we will try and fit our suggestions within the goals that exist and look at the um, objectives and the performance indicators and see in which areas can we make suggestions um, that would work. Thirdly, um, The uh, group did recognize um, the role of the international office as well as the internationalization committees that exist in the university. And also recognized that that committee has done a lot of work uh, that we could borrow from. Um, and so um, we did find a lot of, so we went back to the documents uh, that have been produced by that group we went back to the work of the international office in various, in various other areas um, to find what is it that is there uh, that could be helpful in fashioning uh, the work uh, that we do. Now, the, the group did not benefit as much as it should uh, from some of the key persons within the university, especially with relation to, in relation to um, uh, external partnerships. Uh, there are people in this <coughs> university who do amazing work um, and we could have liked to have those people in our deliberation so that they could share with us um, some of the knowledge, um, experiences um, and some of the things that they actually do. So we did not benefit from, uh, during, our meetings came at a rather difficult time so we could not get everybody that we would have wanted to get. Um, so you will see that our suggestions with regard to uh, external partnerships uh, leave certain gaps uh, that could have been filled if we had people do the actual work. 
Uh, we have some directors here um, uh, who uh, we have directors of uh, and, and, and directors of centers who do uh, on day-to-day -day basis are involved uh, in external um, partnerships who do research across the globe uh, who would have benefited from but we were not able we were not able to get them because uh, of the busy schedule uh, and because of the limited time so with that in mind uh, let me now take you through some uh, of the things that we did. But first, um, I will start with the, um, our terms of reference, or at least how we understood them. Yes. Let's start with the terms of reference, at least how we understood them. Um, the first is to look at um, uh, the proportion of our international students in the university, and whether there is a need to put a cap on the number of international students who come to Rhodes. The second thing that we want, we, we agreed should be uh, the focus of our discussion uh, is how to support uh, international students who are already there at Rhodes, and, and, and that did, did raise quite some interesting discussions. The third thing is how we can strengthen exchange programs that we have, because that is a strong limit, a strong pillar uh, of our internationalization project. And thirdly, was how to ensure that our graduates are conscious uh, of the world in which they live in, um, and how whether they have a sense uh, of the importance of diversity, uh, of the importance of functioning in a world uh, which has different um, human beings, um, and whether they are socially um, conscious uh, of these matters, and uh, how to ensure that we do that. Uh, and lastly, is how we deepen collaborations. And the group did place lots of focus here uh, on the African continent. Um, um, how, how should we increase the collaboration? And, and in the recent past, you've seen that we've had visitors from other parts of Africa and other universities in the continent. Uh, and most of you who interacted with those visitors uh, did benefit a lot from hearing about what's happening in, 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 uh, across the African continent and keeping, of course, with the African Union's vision uh, of, uh, of 2030. So th those were what we understood to be our terms uh, of, of, of reference. Now, the process was uh, a bit hurried uh, in our view. Uh, we could have had perhaps much more engagement, um, but we, we did two things. We had meetings and we, had, uh, we sent out a survey. Uh, we had three meetings. The first meeting, we were lucky that the, the vice chancellor did attend. Um, and we did, we did find out, he did talk a little bit about what he perceives to be um, some of the issues that we should engage in. Um, and um, the second meeting, uh, we then delved into the issues and, and tried to discuss them uh, as we understood them. Uh, and of course, the last meeting was where we tried to put uh, things together um, for, for this presentation. Uh, we got a lot, I must say that we got a lot of assistance from um, the international office. Um, a number of interns there were very, very helpful. And of course, the director of the international office, um, uh, all of us here. And then we did send out a survey um, that um, came out, maybe it, uh, it was a little late, um, uh, in the sense that there were other surveys that uh, the university community was dealing with at the time. Uh, but we got 30 responses, which we thought was, <laughs> was, was reasonable, and they were good responses. Um, and it is from those responses we were able to see the voice of some key persons. <laughs> we were able to see it. Some, some, some of them even did write to me and say, well, you know what, I've, I've done something with your survey. Um, and we got some really good responses there uh, about some of the issues that we, we did raise. Um, um, and uh, we have attached uh, an analysis of those surveys in our, in our documentation at the very end. So uh, please do find time uh, to look at them. Now, the, the group um, 
had certain findings. Uh, I'm sorry that there the are quite many because we because we we, we identify the fact that <coughs> internationalization cuts across uh, almost all the goals. So that is why the list is a little a little longer. But let me just mention a few. Um, the the co a comprehensive strategy for internationalization is something that we should have. Um, and that it is necessary and, and it, impacts on our, uh, we, 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 it impacts on our curriculum um, and that um, it impacts on student experience, um, it, it impacts on our recruitment and, and several other things that we do. And then secondly, that the, the group attempted the discussion, actually did discuss the issue of putting a cap on the number of international students and were not able to do so. Um, instead, they said, uh, the group was of the view that perhaps we should increase efforts in, in recruitment, because clearly we don't have as many as we should have. Uh, but it was very difficult for the, for the group to come um, uh, to uh, an agreement about the percentage of international students that we should have at Lourdes University. Um, there were discussions about what's happening around <coughs> the country, some, some universities um, putting a cap of 15%, others at 20%, and, and so on and so forth. But there was really no scientific um, agreement uh, or data to suggest uh, which or what percentage uh, would be useful for us. So the group was of the view that perhaps more effort should be put uh, on recruitment. Um, the group also did um, find that perhaps it is time for us to develop some kind of dashboard. Uh, which has all the information about the partnerships that we have. And, and that comes from, first of all, from struggling to get our key uh, researchers to come to our committee. We said, well, if we had a dashboard, we could probably just go there and find out what uh, people are doing ar around campus. So it was a really strong recommendation from the group that perhaps we should, this is something that we should think of uh, going, uh, going forward. Um, and increase uh, engagement with the potential partners across um, um, the continent um, and capacitate the international office. Um, um, the group did uh, suggest that uh, perhaps it is also time for us to reimagine what we want out of the international office um, and um, staff it adequately and then position it so that it becomes a key uh, um, um, organ. Uh, of the university. So those, those were some of the uh, key findings uh, of the group. But as you can see, uh, those findings cut across all the other goals um, that we, uh, we have in our, on our present uh, IDP. Ready? Um, we did not spend a lot of time discussing the, the sort. We did spend a lot of time discussing our strengths, weaknesses, uh, opportunities, or threats. But, but we did list a few uh, strengths and weaknesses that we thought uh, would not only guide this discussion, uh, but also guide the work of the uh, internationalization uh, committee. Um, uh, some of the strengths there have already been mentioned. Uh, we, we have a variety of uh, international research going on in the university. Um, uh, that is quite, quite evident. Uh, we have some centers of excellence um, that, we, that we have in the university that is doing amazing work, uh, which is uh, our strength. Um, we have potential for engaging on intra-African mobility consortia. We already have contacts there. Um, all what we need now is staff and, and willingness to engage. Uh, we have an active international office. We all know about the Africa Month. Uh, showcasing internationalization at clothes and abroad. Uh, you all know the internationalization award uh, that we give every year. Uh, you all know about the work that is being done in respect of advising students on international matters, visa issues, and visa support. You all know that um, uh, those, those kinds of things that we, um, that we do, all those kinds of things. Um, we also have a well connected, um, active academic. Uh, uh, the university. Uh, if we had a dashboard, perhaps we could be able to simply by a touch of a button, we could be able to know who's doing what. Uh, but we do have them. 
Um, and we've done an amazing job, amazing, wonderful people at Rhodes University. So we are a preferred um, uh, uh, host uh, for many of uh, uh, leading international scholars. Uh, I think almost every week there's somebody around the world who's coming from somewhere to, to give a talk uh, or to engage in some research or short visits uh, and things of that nature. Uh, some of the weaknesses that I do not want to spend so much time on is the, is we, we work in silos. We, we don't know who's doing what and we do different things. Um, perhaps if we knew what each one is doing and we work together, uh, we could be able to maximize our resources. Um, um, we don't have a dashboard, I've already mentioned that. Uh, issues of resources, um, insufficient resourcing, uh, not enough support for international students, uh, and this did come out from the surveys, uh, because the, student, the survey was also available to, uh, to our students, and it did come out very clearly that, that the students um, are unhappy about uh, not being supported uh, in seven weeks. And then um, there were also um, there was also mention of lack of incentive for staff to work on internationalization. Um, some, some staff felt that there is really no, they are not being um, sufficiently uh, recognized uh, when they do some uh, international, uh, international work. Then there was also mention of, uh, of uh, a lack of orientation for international students, which is uh, becoming quite an issue and did come out in some of the surveys and also international staff. Now, because I'm running short of time, perhaps it's good for me to just go straight into uh, some of the recommendations that we, uh, that we had. Ten minutes left. Um, because um, the position that we took is that internationalization cuts, cuts across all the goals, um, we, uh, the slides that I'm about to show are quite, um, uh, they're quite, uh, the, the, uh, yeah, they're, they're quite dense because we tried to make recommendation in respect of areas that we felt should have internationalization in them. Um, on goal one, uh, the main issue there that we thought should be considered as, as an objective is the issue of recognition of foreign qualifications and foreign credits. Um, we thought that if we are going to promote uh, exchange uh, programs, we are going to promote uh, study abroad, which we are recommending that we should perhaps uh, put some money in and, and increase, then we should have some kind of um, uh, protocol for recognizing those, uh, including uh, recognition of prior learning uh, from um, African mobility students, so from students coming from uh, outside the uh, continent. Uh, and we thought that uh, this would be uh, extremely important. On goal two, and then, of course, there's you know, adding a few things here and there uh, to some of the objectives that are uh, in, goal, uh, in goal one. In goal two, uh, there are two main issues. The first is the issue of recruitment, and this has been uh, talked about uh, several. Uh, the group was of the view uh, that um, our recruitment strategy should have an international component, and that component should be adequately resourced. Um, and there were also discussions around how far the international office can be involved in that process and, and what it would, it would need to do that. Uh, but the group felt very strongly that uh, perhaps we should now look at the way in which we recruit students uh, and um, also borrow from some examples that we've seen. Uh, what was interesting though is that uh, in the surveys that we sent, there were some concrete suggestions about how this could be done. Uh, some suggested that we could use um, international students who we, don't, we already have. Uh, some suggestions were that we could use uh, social media or increase our visibility in, in different ways. Um, and I do remember that uh, the Dean of Humanities at one time posted um, the, an advert of NWU um, at the airport, at, uh, at, at Oliver Tambo Airport. The universities are advertising the um, and then oh, some suggested that we should build on certain programs, especially those with the external partnerships component, uh, to attract um, students. Um, others even suggested reduction of administration, admin hurdles, academic ambassadors, uh, online courses. There were all kinds of suggestions in our 
uh, in the service that we've come to that perhaps we could, we could use um, uh, to, to, to revamp our uh, recruitment uh, strategy. Uh, but the most important thing, uh, as far as our concern, is the issue of visibility. We need to be visible across the continent, and we need to think of strategies uh, of doing that, so that students can prefer um, our university when they are considering admission, so that we can also attract uh, fee-paying international students, uh, rather than just postgraduate students who are, who are looking for funding. Uh, and then the second thing is, um, um, the issue of um, um, study abroad um, and the importance of doing of supporting those and increasing those uh, across our departments uh, so that students can have a sense of what's happening outside the country and when they come back with those qualifications then we have a protocol um, that allows us to um, determine where they fit uh, into our uh, academic program. Um, and then, of course, uh, the issue of promoting higher sense of appreciation of our constitutional values, but that has already been talked about uh, by the other group, so it could simply fit into those discussions, including sensitizing our students about hate speech, xenophobia, uh, and everything else that, uh, uh, that goes against the, uh, the values that we consider to be uh, important. On goal three, On goal three, um, on research, um, we of course are suggesting um, uh, increasing collaboration, and as I've already mentioned, we could have benefited more here uh, from uh, discussion with uh, our leading researchers. Um, <coughs> launching of uh, joint degree programs, there are, there are many universities, uh, many collaborators who might want uh, to have uh, degrees that is uh, being um, uh, that studies. Um, uh, being hosted by two universities, um, have joint uh, uh, degree programs even within roles because uh, some international students might prefer to, uh, to have um, two degrees um, at, the same, uh, at the same institution. Um, um, and of course, uh, uh, proactive recruitment uh, uh, and practical orientation of staff and students um, uh, would also be, uh, should also be uh, considered. Uh, right. Now, on goal on goal, we, we did have much to say about goal four, but we had something to say about goal five. Um, um, the group felt that there should be a way in which we monitor uh, international staff in the demo uh, and their demographics. Um, uh, to be able to identify the kinds of resources that we have there um, and that they could also help with recruitment and so on and so forth. Um, uh, train staff in intercultural competence, we, the group felt that it is extremely important that staff should be trained to be aware of some of these uh, diversity issues and intercultural issues um, so that they, when they deal with students in a variety of areas, including the residences, uh, they are aware uh, of some of these, um, uh, these issues. Um, and of course, the issue of in, uh, incentives did, did come up quite a lot uh, in our uh, discussions. Um, in, goal, in goal six, when? Oh, there we are. Uh, in goal six, we didn't have much to say, perhaps just to suggest that uh, we should add the issue of uh, international student orientation um, into our own, uh, into our into our program and see ways in which uh, we, we could um, organize our orientation uh, program so that we are able to assist international students, uh, both undergraduate uh, and um, and postgraduate. And then on goal seven, sorry. Um, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going. Let's swim all into the distance. <laughs>
Is this side? Deep water, are we?
so I was just wondering that when we go into our groups tomorrow, whether we couldn't actually put that as a, you know, first item on our thought patterns, you know, how do we connect what's being done now in the various boxes with each other, because I feel like there must be some headline of things that we should agree on that goes into each of them. I'm not sure we see if I'm making myself clear, but it's just as I was listening all afternoon, it felt like there must be a few key things we should agree on, and then that will kick back into all of the details across. And I'm not sure when that's going to happen. Can I suggest, as I was going to make an announcement about homework, can I suggest that whatever working group you are in, that you actually focus on the other documentation when you get a chance this evening to do with other working groups, and so that you can start to make those connections tomorrow. And then obviously the working groups, or your breakaway groups, would then be trying to integrate that and find those interconnections as well. So absolutely, I think um, we have a clear direction which came from the vision and the mission. And during the course of the day, we start to get a bigger picture of how everything connects together. But also notice that um, we will have a session whereby the breakaway session um, chairpersons will bring back summaries. And I think there too, we will have an opportunity to identify those key interconnections or common areas that, uh, that exist. Good. Thank you. Um, my suggestion um, listening to all the presentations is that um, we spend a little time on the goals because there, there seems to be general, you know, consensus on maintaining the goals. Um, where the bulk of the work is, is on the objectives. And we, to that effect, we are going to um, provide a template that will help us in thinking through the objectives, helping to guide in coming up with actionable um, items around the objectives like, and the key performance indicators and also the resources required to achieve. Yes, thanks. Sorry, I just wanted to make one point. Um, each working group had a number of facilitators within the sessions. And it might be useful if one of those facilitators moved to another group. For example, within the student uh, teaching and learning student access, there's people who might be might have a um, good contribution to infrastructure. So think about uh, maybe within the facilitation teams in the original working groups, you can come to a consensus and maybe send someone to another working group for an hour, or um, think about that cross pollination that may benefit. Um, so I'll leave that, the, the, the documents there, it's editable, um, maybe decide where the facilitators of those working groups uh, could reassign. As to you the mic so you could have closed the session. I'm going to hand over to who wants to close the session, ready? As the program director, you get to close today's session. Thank you, uh, colleagues, for participating. It's been a rich day. I, I know lots of information to condense. Um, hopefully, we will be able to distill these into actionable items for our new IDP um, um, tomorrow. Um, yes, certain. <coughs> Certainly, there are a lot of interconnections and interdependencies. We will try to consolidate also tomorrow what we have decided and uh, provide a summary on Sunday. Um, of course, there will be further work um, into making sure that there are alignments as we go. Thank you very much.